The game is afoot. Attention Sherlock Holmes fans everywhere. Saturday, May 25th, the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes podcast is proud to present BrettCon 2024, a -a once-in-a-lifetime event celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Granada Sherlock Holmes series with the cast and crew who created it. Special guests include Elsie Cubitt herself, Betsy Brantley, Christopher Tabori, a.k.a. Sir Henry Baskerville, the Honorable John Hector McFarlane, also known as Matthew Solon, Captain Croker, played by Oliver Tobias, the Naval Treaties Miss Harrison, Allison Skilbeck, Jack Claff from Lady Frances Carfax, wardrobe designers Kate Turner and Esther Dean, and many more, with additional guests soon to be announced. And we'll be topping off the evening with a special screening of the fan-favorite episode, The Blue Carbuncle, followed by a discussion with director David Carson. Come see original props, wardrobe pieces, merchant tables, and more as we celebrate the world's greatest depiction of the world's greatest detective. BrettCon 2024 will be held in Guildford, just outside of London. Event seating is limited, so visit SherlockPodcast.com or Google Ticket Taylor BrettCon to get your tickets today. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter to see event updates as they are added. We hope you'll join us for this very special gathering of fellow fans of the series from around the globe. I wouldn't miss this for the world. With the corpse of Sir Charles there was found the dread prince of a gigantic hound. The old Baskerville curse drives each heir to the hearse. With his best job, home saga is crowned. The Hound of the Baskervilles Limerick by Dr. Isaac Asimov, who I recently learned held a doctorate in chemistry from Columbia. Hmm. Well, we are back. We're back. For the Hound of the Baskervilles. The game is afoot and the boot is missing. (laughs) Yeah, and this is actually part two of our Hound coverage, so if you missed part one, check your podcast feed and keep an eye out for part three, which will be the extended interviews from the cast and crew of this very special episode. We'll be dropping that one soon, and there'll be some wonderful stories in there that you won't want to miss. You're going to have more Hound material than you know what to do with. (laughs) Yeah. This this is going to be an interesting one to discuss, but I did sit down, as I know you did, and watched quite a few other adaptations of Hound in preparation for this. And, you know, we may talk about those at some point. But frankly, compared to the other dramatizations on offer, it really made me appreciate this one more than I think I ever have. Yeah, well, I feel the same way. It kind of just tells you how hard it is to get this one right. Because well, exactly. it, it is the most popular story. And I feel like most of the adaptations are are not great. Well, and it's a double-edged sword in a way because... I also remember how I felt before I saw those other adaptations, and I don't know. I've always had a pretty good number of criticisms about this one, so I'm interested to see how all that parses out tonight uh, for both of us as we walk through this one. So, I mean, we can't touch on every detail or we'll be here for days, but let's start at the beginning and see what sticks out. Yeah. My first note is the sound of the hound. What do you think of the very first strange vocalizations of the hound here? Because to be honest, it doesn't sound like any dog I've ever heard. I mean, I think Michael Cox described it as a wheeze in his book. And I, I don't know, I mean, part of me wants to give them credit for trying something unique, but I don't know, it's hard to say it's a sound that evokes terror, at least in me. I mean, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do kind of wonder about that too, because I wondered if were they trying to give you a little bit of the sound of the bittern, you know, that Stapleton mentions, you know, mm. is it a bird? Is it a weird animal? What is it? I don't know. I, I think watching the other adaptations, I didn't find myself feeling any kind of terror from any of the sound effects. Sure. They just all sounded generic. Yeah. So maybe they just thought, let's just not do that. Yeah. And we'll come back to this because we actually have a couple of emails uh, regarding the sounds of the hounds. So um, we can we can talk about that more later. But I do have a good note right at the top here. I guess maybe it's not a good sign of things to come, but I do love the stock footage scenes on Baker Street <laughs> oh. that were shot back in season one. Yeah. It's easy to tell that it was like it's all the same actors and stuff from the opening credits, but it's nice to see more of that. So, you know, it's welcome. It's definitely welcome. I mean, but I think that's definitely a point we have to talk about is how many shots get reused in this episode. A lot. Yeah, a lot is the answer. 
old footage from old episodes, but also just shots from this episode getting reused. Yeah. I really felt like there's this mix of really amazing cinematography and then really boring cinematography that unfortunately gets reused. Mm -hmm. And it's like I can hear the photographers and the DP just grinding their teeth, I'm sure, through this whole episode going, (laughs) we're out of money, we can't do anything else, we just have to shoot this shot. Yeah, I'm sure that's the reason for a lot of the troubles with this episode. But I don't know, maybe maybe not all because, uh, well, no. we'll come. It's too early to, to make sweeping generalizations yet. We'll get there. But I do have to, I have to say one thing about the Baker Street stuff. Yeah. Because like you said, it is very welcome. And if you want to get nerdy for just a second, the very first shot we see of Baker Street in the Hound episode is actually the shot that would technically come right after the opening shot of the credits. Right. The carriage with the Nestle's milk and the Hudson soap ad on the front. That comes around the corner, and, and then we're looking at that shot again. And then the second shot lines up with the second shot of the credits, and you know the two men selling the brutal murder in West End newspapers. Yeah. And this is something I never noticed, other than because I watched it in The Hound. In the credits, when Holmes is looking down on Baker Street, yeah. it's that same carriage going by with a Nestle sign on it. And if somebody really wanted to, they maybe could even assemble some of this footage in the way you described. Yeah. So we find ourselves in the rooms of 221B, and one of Holmes's more famous lines is here when he says, some people without possessing genius have a remarkable power for stimulating it. <laughs> I've always found that line, one of Holmes's kind of more egotistical ones. I mean, yeah. and honestly, when I watched any of the other adaptations, I was always looking to see how the actors playing Watson would respond to that line. Yeah, I mean, but here Watson just kind of takes it; it just rolls right off him, you know, which is fine. And but I don't, maybe it's just me, but it just doesn't seem like. I mean, it seems like that would be a pretty cutting remark to say to your best friend, doesn't it? You know, I I feel like they still sometimes fight with wanting to make our Watson a bumbler. Yeah, and some of those lines sneak through. Right, and you know, he says, y- "You may not be a conductor of light," and it's it's almost like damning with faint praise. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. like. You might not be that great, but, you, you know, you stimulate it in others. And he's like, hmm, well, that's something. At least you're helping in some way, Watson. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. But, well, but to your point, I mean, some of the other adaptations, I felt a lot of those really classic lines kind of came across a little wooden. Oh, yeah. Whereas Jeremy and them really bring them to life. It feels like there's a generational change when it comes to the Granada show. It's like there's everything that came before, which was kind of stuck in this old way of doing things, and then there's the Granada show. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Sherlock, the next generation. Yeah, I mean, just a different way of, of speaking to the audience. Right. Yeah, it just feels really different in a very good way. So the walking stick of Dr. Mortimer... Mm. When Holmes holds up the walking stick uh, in extreme close-up, at least on on the Blu-ray anyway, you can actually read the words Sterling Silver stamped on the handle, Mm. which always kind of struck me as cheap, but surprisingly, it's actually not anachronistic. Um, From what I could find, use of the stamp Sterling, you know, meaning 92.5% silver content, started after 1870. Mm. I mean, that's a real tangential piece of trivia, but I mean, because it's right there in your face on the stick, yeah. I thought it was worth mentioning. To me, this scene does a lot. We're introduced to Mortimer, we're introduced to Alice Duncan. I felt, again, with the other adaptations, that Mortimer always felt wrong. Right. He was always, to me, the most wrong in every adaptation. Yeah. Like, he always seemed to be played by an older man who was never quite absent minded, unless it was like comically so. Right. And Alice Duncan. I don't know. I, he's just so good in it that like everyone else just disappears. Even even Denim Elliot. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can't imagine him running his finger across a parietal fissure. You know, it was just I don't know. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I, I think he's uh he's the uh, the Mortimer of our generation. Yeah. To, maybe just to change gears slightly because we're in this moment here on Baker Street. I have in my hands the original Hound of the Baskervilles working script, Mm. uh, which is dated January 29th, 1988. And so uh, this would have been before any rehearsal-related rewrites because on the cover page, it states that the read-through will actually be taking place on February 15th and that the rehearsals will go from the 15th to the 26th and that filming will be from February 29th to April 12th of 1988, which means they only had six weeks of shooting on this, which, you know, by today's standards, it's not terrible, but for Granada back then, making a two-hour movie, that was probably a, a bit tight, if I had to say. Yeah. And and maybe, you know, another reason things had to be streamlined. But 
Frankly, there are sizable differences on almost every single page of this script. Overall, it's it's way more verbose than what ended up on screen. Mm. And I don't know, we'll, we'll touch on just a few examples of it as we go through. But one fun thing about this script, which was written obviously by the great Trevor Bowen, he incorporates a lot of quotes from the story and, and not just dialogue, but in scene descriptions. He'll just lift text from the book and put it in quotes instead of writing his own description of a location or a setting or something, which I think is brilliant because yeah. just keep it as close to Doyle as you can. You know, never a bad idea. But j- just to give you an idea of a few things that changed right here at the start, when Mortimer is describing the look of Sir Charles' face when he finds him dead, mm-hmm. uh, th- this is how the script reads. Watson says, that was the cardiac pain, presumably. Dr. Mortimer says, yes, I suppose it was. Dr. Mortimer is clearly not satisfied with this as an explanation. Watson says, you sound doubtful. Dr. Mortimer says, it was not merely facial distortion. It amounted to an expression of, Watson queries Dr. Mortimer with a glance, of terror, Dr. Watson, of plain terror. Both men become aware of a high-pitched humming and the tapping of a foot from Holmes, a sign of his irritation. The humming stimulates Dr. Mortimer's spaniel, who looks at Holmes expectantly. Finally, Holmes snaps the parchment closed and tosses it to Watson. Hmm. Very gothic and not edifying, (laughs) Holmes turns to Watson. This Hugo, it seems, abducts a young girl against her will. She escapes at night across the moor. He unkennels his pack and hunts her down like an animal. When his three drunken companions follow him, they find the dogs stiff with fear at the neck of a comb. Entering, they find the girl mad. They also confront the cause of the dog's fear. A huge and demonic hound stands there. The blood from Hugo de Baskerville's throat dripping from its black jaws. This hound is supposed to have haunted the family ever since then, to the general misfortune of the line. To be frank, I do not believe it. It may, of course, appeal to your lured taste in fiction, Watson. So, you know, it gets back on track right there, but Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, foot tapping and Holmes being frustrated and I don't know. It's it's different. It's different, but I also wonder if Granada and maybe Trevor and, and maybe the director wanted to kind of play or tease this idea of the gothic and that Holmes is 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 buying into it slightly. Right. There's a line that comes later where Holmes says, there are more things in heaven and earth. And Watson says, we are men of science, Holmes. And Holmes says, and yet. you know, And, and it's a really nice little line. In this script, those lines are swapped. So Watson is the one saying, there's more things in heaven and earth. And Holmes says, we are men of science, Watson. Mm. Watson says, and yet. Yeah. So, you know, it's not in the story. He added it into the script and then he gave it to Watson and then they flopped it at some point to give it to Holmes. Yeah. I do think it's a little, I don't know if disingenuous is too strong a word, but I, I do feel like it's a little, it's a little much. There's some things that happen in the original story where Holmes gets a few things wrong. He follows up a clue that doesn't work out. He gets bested a few times. Sure. And then he says to Watson, you know, take care on your trip because he's worried because he's been bested three times. Right. In the Granada series, it feels like he's going, oh, you know, this thing might be a demon. Be careful, Watson. And it it just changes the whole mood. Well, Jeremy did feel that way. I mean, he disagreed with Trevor Bowen, as we stated earlier. You know, he... Trevor Bowen thought, you can't make this supernatural. And and Jeremy said, no, it absolutely has to be planted early on that it could be supernatural. Yeah. Another thing that really comes across when I read this early script is that Holmes was still the very much more strident, abrasive, early Holmes that we knew up to this point, which I don't think he ended up being in this episode. So, I mean, clearly Jeremy did implement some changes, which we discussed earlier, Yeah. because in the end... It, a lot of that biting wit and frantic energy, like the thing with him tapping the foot here and, you know, getting frustrated, it, it's just, it's all downplayed in the final version that we got. And, and yeah. I mean, I guess we can come back to the overall outcome of that choice that Jeremy made, but I think it's just another thing that takes a little bit of wind out of the sails of an episode that's already kind of light on momentum, you know, because if Jeremy is just going to be less of a driving force... What does that mean for the for the pacing of the show? You know, I do wonder, though, thinking about all these other movies, is it because it's The Hound? Is it because it's well-known? Or is it because you can almost do this story without knowing any of the other stories? Yeah. Because there's a very kind of compact opener with the stick deduction and the skull talk. It doesn't rely on you to have seen any other episodes or know any of these characters because you're kind of introduced to them all. 
I guess it depends on who you believe, but there are scholars out there who have said that Conan Doyle kind of wrote this story without Holmes even in it and then decided, well, if I stick Holmes in this, then I've got two great things in one. So right. <laughs> it's possible that uh, that it was its its own thing. But Let's have Skull Talk. Want to have Skull Talk for a minute? Sure. Let's do that. <laughs> First off, dolicocephalic. Yeah. The, the very short definition is it's having a relatively long skull, longer than it is wide. Right. To take that one step further, it says the standards for denoting dolicocephaly are derived from Caucasian anatomy norms, and thus describing dolicocephaly as a medical condition may not reflect the diversity in different human populations. So again, this was just kind of like, oh, it's phrenology, so we can kind of throw most of it away. Right. But it was also that they were mainly talking about white people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the Klinger book has a few annotations, but it you know just very briefly says superorbital development uh, more or less just means the amount of skull above the eyes. So you know when he says it's quite a development, it means he just has a big a big top head. Mm. One thing I always find odd in adaptations of the Hound is that almost no one ever shows the footprint of the Hound. They talk about it. That's a good point. And I, I mean, maybe I guess they can. I mean, if they did. I guess it would establish at least the incredible size of this dog yeah. early on and, and plant that seed. But if the dog really doesn't end up being that big, right. then I guess you can't do it. But I mean, he saw the footprint and he was scared by it. So I, I feel like, you know, that would be a good way. <laughs> I wonder if it's just the kind of thing that doesn't play on camera because it's hard to judge scale on camera. You yeah. know, like when you see a short person in a close up, you can't tell they're short. <laughs> right. I always just think back to the speckled band and how, you know, they pull that leaf away and there's like a cheetah print out in the garden and it's cool, you know, and I always want them to do that in Hound, but uh, but no one ever does. Well, they did it in uh, the Sherlock BBC. I didn't watch that one actually okay. in, in preparation. <laughs> I, I thought it was too... Uh, it's too different. Yeah, yeah, it's different. Well, so moving on to the Northumberland Hotel, I'm not sure if you know this, but the Northumberland Hotel isn't there anymore. But what is there now in its place? The Sherlock Holmes Pub. Same building. Really? What is odd is that it was only called the Northumberland Hotel for a short while. At some point in the 1880s, it changed to the Northumberland Arms, which it stayed until the 50s. But what's interesting is that Holmes and Watson visit the Northumberland Arms in The Noble Bachelor, which takes place in 1892, and Hound takes place in 1901. And it's magically the Northumberland Hotel again. So there you go. Mm. Another date mystery for the scholars to debate. Mm -hmm. But one more fun piece of trivia about the building. The Victorian Turkish baths that Holmes and Watson used to frequent in the stories were actually located right beside the hotel at 25 Northumberland Avenue, another real place. And the entrance to the adjacent women's Turkish baths is actually still there. You can still see it in the Craven Passage just rear of there. So maybe we can look for that, yeah. uh, you know, if we end up checking out the uh, Sherlock Holmes pub when we're in, in London. Yeah. I think we got to talk about Christopher Tabori for a second. Sure. To me, right from the first moment, I think he slots right into the series. He feels like an outsider, like he should, but he's just utterly convincing. And nothing he does is overdone. There's no cowboy hat. There's no <laughs> thick, generic American accent. He's just natural. Right. He even makes the line by thunder believable. Right, right. Well, I have a good note, which I'll just say it now because my good note is all the acting. Yeah. I mean, with rare exception, even the smaller parts like Dr. Franklin are just, they're just good. And and yes. you, you say Christopher Tabori, but I mean, we talked about Alistair Duncan already, James Faulkner, Fiona Gillies. Everyone is just so damn good. But, you know, I think I might have put my finger on what it is, though, that I like so much. They're all young. Uh, yeah, 100%. You know, as much as I love Jeremy and Edward and Mrs. Hudson and all the regulars, this particular cast is so young that they just bring this energy to it. That I, I mean, I think that might be the biggest thing that really carries this, <laughs> especially, you know, when Jeremy is gone for almost an, an hour of the proceedings. Yeah. They're all just great. I 100% agree. And I, I do feel, I feel like casting is a huge part of what this episode got right. James Faulkner, for example. I mean, maybe this was just luck. I don't know. But the fact that he almost looks a little like Barrymore <laughs> when he's in the cab with his beard on. Yeah, yeah. Like, was that coincidental? And then Ronald Pickup is great. 
and like they're just so different. But it's just I don't know. Something gets left out in every adaptation. Yeah. And I just feel like this one they did a lot right, and then just unfortunately the budget fell out. Yeah. And it but but it was like all the people were still there. And they still kind of dragged it along, you know? Well, speaking of Chris Tabori, I, I've always liked Jeremy's kind of quiet deduction about the note that Baskerville receives in the restaurant. Mm-hmm. And it, it's interesting to hear Chris Tabori tell us that he felt Jeremy was possibly struggling with the lines mm-hmm. sometimes. And, uh, you know, we may never know the extent of that. But I always like this scene, though it's very different in the book in some odd ways, all of which just make me wonder... For example, in the book, when he specifically says there's no watermark on the paper, yeah. and then in the show, they go out of their way to add the watermark, right. but it doesn't really make any difference. And and then like the line about pocket fluff, which I actually love, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and frankly, I love uh, Sir Henry's reaction to it, but <laughs> it's not in the story at all. Yeah. So why add that pocket fluff? I mean, it's just so strange, but I mean, all that aside... I love Jeremy here, whatever's going on in his head. You know, it, it, it's, to me, the best Jeremy moment in the episode is this deduction. And if you like it, it's, it's even bigger in the book. Right. You know, it talks about the ink, it talks about the missing words, and then Sherlock goes off on this kind of unfruitful side mission to find the, the actual paper that it was cut out of. He hires a kid to go dig through trash cans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in 23 <laughs> hotels. Right. You know, and it's like, it's it's just something that wouldn't work. But it was the perfect thing for Jeremy to kind of chew on. And, you know, to what you said and to what Chris Tabori said, I actually just happened to just watch this interview with uh, William Shatner. And it was, it was, he was watching people do impressions of him. Hmm. It was Bruce Campbell doing one. And he wasn't that impressed by it. But then Bruce Campbell goes, you're watching him and sometimes... You think he's being dramatic, and sometimes he's wondering what the next line is, you know. And then William Shatner just laughs, and he's like, yeah, he got it. (laughs) So I think that does happen. Yeah, for sure. But there's also some interesting misdirection here, kind of relying on gender stereotypes, because they keep saying it's a man that sent you this. Right. In the story, I think it said that the handwriting on the envelope was masked. And then it was print. Yeah. But in the episode, it's definitely handwritten. And it's very feminine. If I remember correctly, he actually says a man or a woman in the story a couple times. And then obviously in the story, he smells perfume on the envelope, right. which he ends up figuring out is a, is a clue. So yeah, I mean, honestly, if you just watch the show, the explanation for the letter is just thrown away so quickly in the cave later that I think most people probably wouldn't even know who, you know, where that letter came from or why. Well, the first few times I watched it, I didn't. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing, you know, Trevor Bowen mentioned, which is, you know, he was just a little sad that the lines from A to B to C weren't drawn more clearly in this in this episode in the end. Yeah, but that's a fair criticism. I mean, yeah. uh, there's also kind of a clunky edit in here, too, where he goes, let us tell you what's actually going on now. And then we just cut away and we cut back. And then he goes, wow, that's that's some crazy stuff, you know. Yeah. It just feels a little clunky here and there. So right after this moment, we have the chase scene down the stairs in the hotel, which, you know, as Trevor Bowen mentioned, was perhaps less than optimal. Mm. But it's even worse when you see, which I'm sure you noticed, the electric exit sign <laughs> mm. as Holmes and Watson are pursuing Stapleton after leaving Sir Henry. But see, it gets even worse than that because then they do that neat turning staircase shot. Yeah. But when you're looking straight up at the ceiling, you're seeing, like, is it a light? Is it a fire alarm? I'm not sure. But there's another one in the hallway when they're in the very next hallway part of this chase. And then, by the way, when they go through that door, it's like a big 1980s metal hydraulic hinge on the door. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all very frantic and fast pace. But I just think it's all unfortunate because, (laughs) oh, yeah, then when you get outside... There's a guy sitting there in what I am pretty sure are blue jeans on the bench (laughs) in the chef hat. (laughs) Yeah. But what I was very surprised to learn is that in the script, there's actually no chase scene. In that original Mm. working script, there was nothing at all. And so, I mean, obviously we've heard Trevor Bowen talk about this and we know that there were many iterations of of a chase that were attempted, but reading the script with nothing in there to quicken the pace... Frankly, for the first time, I feel like what we got is is better than nothing. The only thing I would say, though, is I do like the stair shot. Mm-hmm. You know, that's actually something I've always wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> but 
they could have just come out the door and he was just gone. Right. <laughs> rather than he's in a carriage barely moving. And they're barely running. It's just if he was already gone or if he was already down the street, anything would have been better. Right. I feel like this is the exact point where things start to loosen. And unfortunately, it's at this 20 minute mark, you're, you're just, you're in. You bought the ticket, you're taking the ride now. So eventually they arrive at the hall, Baskerville Hall, and we're treated to this 60 second shot of Sir Henry looking at all the paintings and silently reacting to them. Uh, again, just uh, maybe an unnecessarily slow moment. Yeah. But I got to say, I love the house. <laughs> I love the tapestries. I love the paintings. I mean, it's a great house. It looks great. I mean, I, I, I guess I can see the temptation to want to just let the camera float over all this stuff for literally minutes. Yeah, but it's like this like weird juxtaposition because it's like that shot is, I think it's just a tripod shot. But right before mm -hmm. that, on the carriage ride in, there's these really moody moments that feel cinematic and they feel big, you know? Mm -hmm. Just interesting use of the camera and the blocking of the actors and the sound, you know, like they're driving into the heart of darkness, as Trevor Bowen puts it. But then, yeah, we get to the house and it's like a tripod shot. Mm -hmm. It's Everything is so stilted in this episode. It's like there's these amazing moments and then these really, you know, we hear the clock ticking and it's like, that's what it feels like. It's just like we just slowed right back down again. And I wasn't going to say it, but that clock tick is like a bad loop because it's not an actual clock tick <laughs> and it like resets every five seconds. It's but imagine if we didn't have it. I know. And I guess speaking of technical issues around this point, and I, I know you heard this too, but this is the point where we start to have this very strange double audio track mm -hmm. start running underneath the final sound mix from time to time. And it... I mean, it comes back a surprising number of times in the episodes, and you you know you probably won't hear it unless you have the headphones on. Yeah. But what it is is you can hear the lines being spoken at random points in the scene before or after they're actually said by the actors. So right. you know, at first I thought it was actually like radio mic, like um, uh, lav interference. mic interference. Yeah, I, that's what I thought it was at first. I wonder if someone was like feeding lines to the actors. But really, I think it's just some kind of bizarre audio problem. But but what's sad is that I checked uh, all the copies I have, and it's on I think all of them. So yeah. it's it's somewhere in in the master. It's in there. At first, I thought, well, maybe they added all that thunder <laughs> to try and cover it up because they knew it was there and they couldn't get rid of it. Right. But I I just don't know. It's just I'm just bringing it up because it's like a, a strange quality issue that we've never had before. Yeah. And Frankly, you know, like you won't be able to hear it in the podcast because I tried to cut it out for the most part, you know, like when you're listening to the retelling of the of the story. But yeah. maybe this is just another example of running out of money. Yeah, it's just it's just like a slip, you know? Yeah. I wondered if like if they were just reusing the tape to save money. It could be. And, you know, that it was like burned into the tape a little bit. I've heard that on albums. Yeah. Like famously Bohemian Rhapsody was like falling apart and you can hear on the other side of the album, like where the tape was. And, yeah. It's possible. I mean, if, if you want to hear like the clearest example of it, it's the scene where Watson is with Beryl Stapleton and she runs away and then he yells to Stapleton and says, catch anything? And you, you can just hear it like a double track because they're both yeah. yelling. Because they're it's, shouting. It's yeah, so yeah. clear in that moment. Yeah. But one really nice moment I thought was there's a shot of Watson on the stairs in a tuxedo mm -hmm. and it just feels like this classic movie entrance something you'd expect as like the start of a retrospective on Edward's career. It's just a really nice moment. The man looks good in a tux. Yeah. I do have a question for you that maybe the script can answer. The scene in Baskerville Hall when Watson is basically tucking himself in for the first night. I never liked these voiceovers here, but especially the one that happens after Watson goes to sleep. It always feels like it was unnecessary and it kind of bordered on comedy. Yeah. Like I imagined... Watson was supposed to open his eyes and, and, you know, wake up and think about something, but he just goes to sleep. It just feels very strange. Were they added because it was so sparse or is it because there was just no dialogue? What I don't like about it is I feel like they're trying to make sure the audience remembers things that we've already been told. I feel like it's really talking down to the audience. But was it that or was it because there was no dialogue? There's a lot of things we don't know in terms of what was done in production and what was part of the script as it got shot and what came later as like, let's try to fix this. Let's try to speed this up by adding in Holmes's voice or, right, right. you know, we haven't seen Holmes in a minute. Let's have his voice come back in. Like, I feel like there's a lot of things in this episode that were band-aids they tried to put on in post-production 
And I think this is one of them. You know, this isn't in the script. These these voiceover moments, I don't think they're in the script there. Yeah. I think they just decided, like, you know what? It's too slow. We just got, we need more dialogue, people. Throw something in that we already have, you know? You know what's funny, though, too, is, like, we spoke to, like, eight people that worked on this episode. And, like, nobody had an answer for this kind of stuff. <laughs> so, like, I wonder, it, maybe it really was a last-minute thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, around this point is when Watson starts writing his letters to Holmes, who, depending on <laughs> which moment we're in, he's either in Baker Street or in Grimpen, and we can, we'll talk right. about that at some point. But there's one moment here where we see Holmes sitting in Baker Street, Looking at himself in the mirror, I presume, with his pipe, kind of just thinking, pondering Watson's reports. Not super exciting stuff, but I did find the alternate version of this in the script quite a bit more interesting. I don't know. You want to hear a short alternate version of this? Yes. So we've just left Stapleton and and Watson is writing his report. Stapleton's voice fades as we mix from his butterflies. We hear a short tapping, Meerschaum on Marble. Then Watson's voice is laid over as we go to his report, and we hear Watson saying a magnificent collection and the work of a serious scientist, even the Exotica. But in the description it says, Holmes, as he stands in his dressing gown, absentmindedly filling his pipe from the oriental slipper, he reads Watson's letter, which is propped against the bric-a-brac on the mantelpiece. Then as Watson's voice continues, it says, Holmes turns aside from the letter, and Watson's voice stops. Holmes lights his pipe, but he is hardly concentrating on it. Once lit, he takes a single puff from it, and then his hand, holding the pipe, falls to his side. Holmes thinks. Then we mix to Holmes's Meerschaum pipe, where it now lies on a small oriental brassware table. Smoke is drifting through the room. The camera eventually discovers Holmes sitting cross-legged in a meditative position in front of the fire at which he stares. Beside Holmes, on the eastern rug on which he sits, lies sheets of Watson's letter, Close up on his letter, we read parts of the letter at this point. I must also report that the new brown boot has turned up. Silence. We go back to the letter. We go back to Holmes, who's staring at himself, lost in a trance, and then we're back to where we were. But I mean, it's Mm. basically like, you know, three or four more shots of a montage of Holmes doing interesting things with, by the way, a Meerschaum pipe, which, you know... Yeah. yeah, that would have been the only other time we would have seen that. Yeah, part. it would have been interesting. Again, obvious why they didn't do it because instead of four or five shots, you get one shot. But man, it, it's actually a really clever way to have done it because, like, he looks away and the and the, and his voice stops. In a movie, I think that would have been a really effective scene. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Holmes and what I like to call his side quests back in London. Yep. I feel like again, this was a good idea in theory. But almost none of them work just right. I mean, either the footage is recycled or it's just disconnected. You know, he's in Grimpen one minute, then he's in London the next. I I feel like it's a no-win situation because, you know, you want more homes, but there's a reason he's not there. His absence is part of the mystery. Mm -hmm. And for a while, I always wondered, like, were these things shot later to try and quicken the pacing, as we said, you know, or, or were they in the early script? It's on par, I would just say, it's a misstep to try and crowbar Holmes back in. I think I have like a slight theory on at least one moment of that. Yeah. The moment when we're on Baker Street and we see the carriages going by and then we see Holmes looking out the window and then it's the shot from the Greek interpreter. All of those are reused. So that wasn't something they shot because the shot of him looking out the window is when he's sitting there with Watson. Right. All three of those shots were from somewhere else. So it kind of makes you think it was an afterthought and it was just like, we need to see Holmes again. Well, I don't know. Again, maybe someday we'll find the Rosetta Stone and the the editor's assistant will come forward and tell us some of the decisions that went into some of these things. And be like, they made me do it. They made me do it. Exactly. So we have the the dinner sequence. And then uh, that evening, I think it is, Barrymore does the signal light at the window. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you must have noticed this. The guy who sends the signal back waving his lantern in the fog. Yeah. Uh, whoever that was, pretty sure it wasn't William Ilkley as Selden because <laughs> he has a full head of hair, for one thing. Yeah. You know, frankly, I didn't put that together until the last time I watched it. It's just one of those things that's so obvious, I assume it's right. And again, like, I think they just assumed we wouldn't see him very well in the fog. Right. But I don't know. I, I feel like there's something going on here. I, I wonder if they had other plans for Selden at the start of the production. You know what I mean? Like, And then they changed to a bald character partway through and just didn't reshoot some of it because they didn't have enough money. Because th- there's a handful of cutaways throughout this one 
if you're looking really, I mean, probably, you know, pausing on every frame like I do, where Selden has hair. Did you notice this? Well, there's a moment where Selden is being attacked by the dog, but it's actually Chris DeBorey. Okay, so maybe that's what that was. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Because, like, you know, I was frame by framing that, and I'm like, oh, Selden has hair again during the attack. <laughs> yeah, it was DeBorey. But even that, I'm like, was that clever in that they were going, because remember, they go, oh, my God, it's Sir Henry. But it wasn't. Right. Or was it like we didn't have enough good footage of the dog being aggressive at that point, so we used the Tabori footage? Yeah, I mean, but obviously, I mean, you can't just show hair and then no hair two seconds later. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's just right. obviously it was, I think it must have been a budget problem. But I wonder if it's kind of like you said, though. Like, I wonder if they shot it a couple different ways and then they went, that's never going to show, the Y's never going to show up. In a lot of the other adaptations, there was like this ultra wide and you just see this little dot of light. And I was like, that's effective, you know, yeah. that it's way out there and it's and it's eerie. When we cut to a guy just standing in this, in the, you know, it's not as eerie, but maybe it just wouldn't play on TV. Well, you just uh, put your finger on the culprit of a number of issues in this one because um, my next note is when the Watson spots Sherlock on the moor mm. and says, look, and it's literally Jeremy Brett behind a branch. Yeah. I mean, who else could it be? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so close. I mean, it's and honestly, yeah. I almost want to give them credit for even trying that because it is in the book. In the book, it's it's absolute silhouette, though. Right, exactly. But but it's the kind of thing that only works in a book. You know what I mean? Like, like you're going to know, like, it, it, clearly it's going to be Jeremy Brett if he's wearing his signature hat and clothes and he's got his, you know, it, you're going to know even in silhouette. Right. It's just that, I don't know, I just don't think it's possible to do that well. I almost think which I think they did. I think there's a fake moon. It's just a paper moon behind them. Mm -hmm. But if they had like a humongous paper moon <laughs> to where, it, you know, that it was, and it was like much wider to where it was just like a stick figure on a on a hill yeah. with the moon behind them, to me that would have been like epic. You know, it's like the pageant illustrations. Well, that's probably why they didn't do it because obviously on the stage, on the set that they had to work with for those rocks, it wasn't a big wide room. You know, it was right. a small room and they just couldn't get a wide shot. But I mean, it's, it's just that, again, every time we see Jeremy emerging from wherever in this, you know, whether <laughs> know. it's his glove or his shoes on the rocks, it's like, it's so clearly Jeremy, you know, it's clearly know. him with his, with his walk and his scarf dangling and, and, you know, his, his acting it's, it's his little tiptoes. Yeah. It's, yeah. He's just, he's just too much of a character. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, again, a lot of the adaptations solve this problem by, introducing him in a disguise at some right. point and then having the disguised character be the one that tiptoes around and has the silhouette on the more. And I don't hate that change. No. And I, I think people learn that lesson going like, you know, this isn't going to work. If we show, a, a, you know, a, a London gentleman in, in a deerstalker hat, we're going to know it's Sherlock Holmes. I mean, if he's living out on the moor, you figured he could have just taken off his hat and had a blanket wrapped around him, and then we wouldn't know who the hell he was because right. we were only getting a silhouette of, of a guy in a blanket. Mm -hmm. And then that would have been maybe even creepy rather than just like, who was that guy in the Deerstalker or who was that guy in the really nice Homburg? You know? Yeah, right. But it's, again, they probably had an hour to get that shot. I know. And it was, what are we going to do? And it's like, well, it's obviously Jeremy. Like, we'll put a branch in front of him. Yeah. You got to do what you got to do to get it done. I mean, I think I, saw, I stopped counting after like six or seven times of seeing the hall from the exact same angle. Yeah. And it's just because they probably only had 20 minutes to go get that shot and they just had to reuse it. And I mean, you know, th those of us who work in that industry, we've we've all been there, but this is Granada. This is the cream of the crop and this is the best Sherlock Holmes of a generation doing the best story of the of the whole canon. It's like It's unfortunate. Yeah. But it's it just comes down to decision making. I mean, it, it you've said it. They had the opportunity, we could do two episodes, or we could do this big one. And they went, let's do the big one. And it just didn't pay off. It was just, yep. it's just really unfortunate that it happens to be the Hound also, because it could have been something else. Right. So there's a line that's not in the book, but I think it's a great little period accurate addition. Uh, the moment when Sir Henry says to Watson, you'd make a very civil gooseberry, Watson, but no, I must go alone, you know, when he's when he's mm -hmm. heading out to Merripit House. Um, gooseberry in the Oxford English Dictionary states, a chaperone, especially one who is indulgently unobservant as to play gooseberry, a superfluous third person. So in other words, back then, the chaperone was supposed to be present, but not so near that they could overhear the conversation. Mm. So they would act out a role like reading a book or tending to flowers or 
picking fruit, aka playing a gooseberry picker, which became a euphemism for the act. So, yeah. as someone online put it, it's it's a charming piece of faux Victorian English, and I just want to say well done to Trevor Bowen for including it because you know it's not in the story, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a nice little addition. I thought that was great. They kind of turned into this new crime fighting duo because Sherlock is missing. Mm-hmm. But I actually like that Sir Henry retains some of that assertiveness. Yeah. You know, he he shouts at Barrymore, but he also kind of reminds Watson of his place. Like he is Sir Henry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he is rich. He has a lot of power. But I, I felt like again this was kind of lacking in other adaptations, but I like that it was in there. Yeah. And then the scene at the tour itself I thought was very compelling. You know, the sneaking around this new romance, the confrontation by Stapleton. It's just at this point, I'm like, what are we watching? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're right. It is a good scene. I feel like we're watching a romance. I mean, the performances are good, but again, if you if you like, you start thinking about like when the music cuts out to when the music comes back. It's like you know, we got a good like seven minutes of just wind blowing and acting. That's a great point. I feel like a lot of the time in this. I mean, one of the notes I kept writing down. Then I was like, the music has just checked out. Yeah. Maybe that's because we're going, it's atmospheric and we don't need the music. But then I was also wondering, like, maybe they didn't have enough money to pay Patrick Howard's. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that one either. And then there's like a couple of extremely bizarre music cues, like when we're back in Baker Street and, and we show some more footage from season one. And then it clicks to the theme song for like a bar and then it just fades into other music. Like it's almost like a mistake. Yeah. I mean, it felt like another decision from someone higher up. Like, Tell people we're watching Sherlock Holmes again. Put the theme song in. You know, it just yeah. felt, really felt tacked on. Yeah. I did want to talk about Dr. Franklin for just a minute. I'm curious what you what you think of him. I, I like him. He's not in this version very much. Sometimes he's in them too much in some of the adaptations. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like maybe he could have used more screen time in this one. I don't know. It's true he's over the top, but I, I like him. I don't know. I think he's fun. What do you think about Dr. Franklin? No, I, I do like him. I like the actor. I, I mean, he plays that kind of obnoxious, over-the-top character like perfectly. Yeah. What I found myself wondering was, who was Doyle referencing when he wrote this? Because the character, it's a very specific type of character. He, he, yeah. you know, he's not just gregarious. His whole thing is he plays both sides of everything. Yes. He gets enjoyment out of being right, no matter what. But he only cares about what is legal. Yeah, and I would I would say if there is any character in the Doyle canon that could be considered Dickensian, yeah, this is him. Right? No, that's true. Because he he's just his own little self contained character who plays both sides of the law, and it doesn't even matter who's right or wrong. He just wants to win cases. And again, in a weird way, that's what I don't like about him is that he feels so Dickensian that he feels out of place in a Sherlock Holmes story. But in some adaptations, they really play that up and they embrace that. And he's suing everybody left and right in the whole story. He's just talking about who he's suing and it becomes a comedy character. Yeah. Maybe that's what he's supposed to be. I'm not sure. But I just feel like they nail the balance really well here. And almost like I almost wish he had a little more screen time, but he's enjoyable. And like, I wish there was (laughs) more of a point to him. Right. Like he's almost just he's almost just a story point. Right. That's one of the things that is missing from this adaptation is the, the dinner party scene is the example. It's supposed to introduce all these possible suspects. Could it be Dr. Franklin? Could it be the vicar? Could it be, you know, it could be anybody in the town. And it's so glossed over. I don't even know why they included the dinner scene to be honest. Like it really serves no purpose except for one little glance between Sir Henry and and Beryl Stapleton. I, I totally agree. There's drama that's implied, but it's hardly explicit. You know, they share that glance and it just ends. And, you know, in other adaptations, you know, Stapleton like strangles Beryl. Yeah. And like it's it's this really dramatic moment. And then in this, there's a full minute and 45 seconds of watching people leave the house. I know. With no new information being shared. Yeah. And it's just about as long as the whole dinner scene. Yeah. And it just felt like we could have gone without all of that and we could have gotten something else. They could have made better choices in a, in a lot of this stuff, yeah. Are there going to be people listening right now going, you guys are so wrong, here's why? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like every now and then something went wrong. 
So, I mean, I do have a good note here, which is just the reunion between Holmes and Watson, you know, Mm -hmm. shaking hands and saying, you don't trust me, but your reports are brilliant, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's a nice moment. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really good friendship moments in this episode and, and, and this is one of them. So it's nice to see. I think it's worth saying that after watching this episode so many times in preparation for this discussion, it's right around this point where I find myself pausing and just kind of wishing Jeremy was in it. And then... (laughs) <laughs> right then is where Jeremy comes in. I, then I wonder if the editor felt the same way. It's just, it's been almost an hour without Sherlock Holmes really in the story. Right. And it's like, it, it was kind of pushing it to me. Well, and I mean, again, it's, I, I think it's, it's some adaptations, you know, the amount of Holmes or not Holmes depends on, you know, a lot of them solve the problem by, like I said, having him dressed up right. in a disguise. So it's like the audience, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, like, yes, he's there. But again, in those adaptations, he's not back in Baker Street, right. which is wrong for the story. He shouldn't be going back to Baker Street. That's not where he is. He's here. you know. So right. it's strange. But then, even though I said it was a good note when they reconnect, I put this in my bad note category, <laughs> which is the stew. Yeah. I know we should like this moment, but it's, it's <laughs> obviously, it's just a retread of the moment in the Priory School. And I'll tell you this, it's not in the script, which is written by Trevor Bowen, which the Priory School was also written by Trevor Bowen. So my guess is they were like, hey, you guys, you know, it'd be great here. We did it in Priory School and yeah. let's do it again right here. You know, I just feel like this version of the stew moment falls flatter than the other one. And I, I don't like it. I, I wish they would have just left it special in Priory School. But what, what do you think? Um, I think I mostly agree. It only because, yeah, it's almost the same line. We do know from speaking to Trevor that that was like his favorite line of all of the episodes he worked on. In the Priory School, yeah. From the Priory School. So, you know, it's it's acceptable that it would, that it would be here. But yeah, I mean, I like the delivery. Sure. But you're right. It is kind of, it just kind of changes the mood. And this is the point where Selden gets attacked. And we've talked about it a little bit. And honestly, this moment is is very interesting to watch in slow motion or frame by frame. Mm. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about seeing maybe some cutaways of Sir Henry in there that shouldn't be there. But just overall, I just got to be honest, this is this this scene is a mess, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, you've got the first shots of the Great Dane with his green frame by frame painted glow. Yeah. And then it immediately jump cuts to another shot of the dog with no green glow. Right, And then you've got the artificial robot head, and you can tell it's that because if you look at the eyes, they're red, and they're kind of like a painted red. Like red plastic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you if you look closely in the, in the frame by frame, its tongue is like loose, mm. which yeah. is kind of creepy. But I just don't even know what's happening because, again, we got Selden with hair. We got Selden with no hair. I wonder if it's down to the fact that they didn't have, maybe they didn't have one of those elements at that time. Yeah. William Oakley did tell us that he, he had like meat in his pockets and it was the real Great Dane that he was interacting with. And so maybe they just saw the footage and they're just like, this isn't going to work. Yeah. And he's already been sent home. Because I don't think any of that footage is in there because I don't think there's any clips of William Ilkley with his bald cap struggling with the animal, is it? No, I, I don't think so. I think it's it, it yeah. only in the wide. I don't know. It's it's hard to say. You know, I did find a good picture of that head, Yeah, which we'll put up on our Twitter, by the way. It's the kind of thing I, I feel like, if, like you said, if they would have done the frame by frame and they would have colored it, I think it would have been effective. It's just that they didn't do it, and I don't know why. Yeah. It's just frustrating, this whole episode. The scene is like mostly effective. It's just so short yeah. and fleeting that you don't even get a chance to appreciate it. It's just kind of the, the name of the game of this episode, and like it happens again later. Yeah, I do like that Stapleton was there, though. Like, kind of watching the crime scene. Yeah. I thought that was a good touch, because like, I think in the other ones, he just kind of goes, hey, what's going on? You know? But I like that he's actually creeping around. Like, uh, that was a good touch. Yeah, no, I agree on that. So just after the death of Selden here in the working script that we have, we do get another example of a very much different Holmes. And I want to read a small little passage. So right after Selden falls off the cliff, we have this. Watson says, Sir Henry, Holmes says, Stapleton has beaten us, Watson. We are too late. Watson says, Dear God, how shall I ever forgive myself? Holmes stares, the anger mounting in him. He shall answer for this. Holmes turns and sets off down the slope. Cut to the foot of Grimpen Cliff, Watson and Holmes approach the body. As they near it, Holmes dashes forward and holds the lantern to the half-hidden face. Holmes says, Ah! Aha! 
Holmes bursts into a catterwall of laughter. Oh, Watson, it's not the baronet. It's not Sir Henry. It's my wretched neighbor, the convict. <laughs> Watson is relieved, but cannot feel Holmes's triumph. So anyway, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Holmes is laughing. Holmes is, you know, just so happy that it was only uh, <laughs> Selden that got killed and not Sir Henry. Yeah. I mean, it plays in terms of the story. Different mood. Yeah, in terms of what the, the Holmes character, but it definitely doesn't play in terms of what Jeremy Brett is doing with this version of Hound. So, right. you know, I don't know when that change got implemented, but... That would have been a really different take on that moment. Yeah, that would have felt really strange, I think, coming in there. So maybe that was a good choice. Yeah. So speaking of the shooting script, this is something I kind of didn't understand why they did and and why it was so different from the story other than extra money for casting. When Holmes and Watson go to the train station, was it really a worry? Did did they actually have to go to the train station and then hop off the train immediately after boarding? Like, (laughs) was someone supposed to be watching them that closely that... As soon as they get on, they wouldn't keep watching. Like, and who was watching? Like, I don't understand that moment. Well, I guess it's possible that Stapleton could have followed them and could have wanted to check and make sure. And again, maybe Holmes wasn't a hundred percent sure at that point that Stapleton didn't have a Confederate, that you know, a report wasn't going back to him, something like that. But they they walk on and then jump right out. It's just weird. Yeah, it is weird. I don't know if you noticed this, but they flopped some of this footage Hmm. when Holmes and Watson sneak out of the train. If you look at the shot of the man waving the flag, the letters on the train are backwards. Hmm. So I assume, again, they just kind of had to do this to make the position seem correct. Yeah, to make the train go the other way or something. Yeah. Was Lestrade in the original script? No, no, he wasn't. And he is in the the story, which I don't know if people know, but yeah, Lestrade comes to the rescue at the end which I really like, Um, but no, he's not in the original script. I think they knew, frankly, from the beginning that they just couldn't afford. I mean, I I honestly, in this case, I don't even think it had to do with his schedule. I think it was just they couldn't afford another actor, so. Well, I think even in the original story, he's only got like two lines. Yeah. They just bring him in right at the end, but. It's true, but the way they do it in the story, even just reading the story and imagining Colin Jevons makes me smile. I agree. Like, you know, like having him have a hero moment, like, you know, it would have been so, so great. Yeah, and I think even in the story, Holmes really compliments him. He's like, we've got Scotland Yard's best joining us tonight. Right. And it's like, it would have been a nice moment. It would have felt like, you know, some one of these big action movies where like Thor walks out the door with his hammer, you'd be like, oh, <laughs> it's him, you know, he's here, you know. It's a, it, 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 I don't know if yeah. it would have saved the whole episode, but it would have made for an interesting moment for sure. Exactly. Can we talk about Laura Lyons? Yeah, sure. <sighs> <laughs> this whole scene perplexes me. Yeah. I mean, I know in the story, this was two different scenes. You know, Watson goes by himself and then they go together and even that seems yeah. weird and clunky. But in the episode... There's so much time dedicated to the shock of Beryl being Stapleton's wife that Mrs. Lyons has to pause, go wash her face, and we watch this happen. Yeah. And then we wait for her to walk the length of her entire house to return to Holmes and Watson. And we already know. We already know this detail. Yeah. So it's 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 sort of like if Leia needed a minute to process the news of Vader as Luke's father while they're escaping Cloud City, spoiler alert. But it's like... We already know. So why do we need to like yeah. pause? It's just the pausing. In my notes, I wrote, Laura Lyon scene, wasted time. Because, <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm I'm kind of only half joking, but it's like, I'm really tempted to see if this film couldn't be edited into an hour long episode. Mm. I don't think it would do anything for the missing atmosphere, but honestly, I think it could be done. Yeah. Just cutting out all the stuff of Holmes in London, cutting out lingering shots and duplicate shots i think you could get this down to like an hour and i wonder if it wouldn't play better because you know you're not going to get the atmosphere it's it's missing but you could at least take out some of the the pacing issues yeah i don't know i'll I'll add it to my list of things to do in the declining years but uh well watson confronts holmes about laura Lyons, and he's like yeah i already know like, what do they get from her? What did we learn? Well, I think you just you just have to close the gap. It's like the Baker Street Irregulars in The Sign of Four. It's like, if you don't show them, then the super fans are going to wonder why we never saw Laura Lyons. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> anyway, as we kind of approach the climax of the tale, I have a note here about Sir Henry and the fact that he goes to his dinner party, but he doesn't have a gun, which... He does have. Right. We, <laughs> we go to great lengths to establish earlier in the show that he has a gun. 
you know, in the story, he doesn't. In the story, he has a hunting crop. But that's the way Doyle wrote it. And frankly, like in the show, you know, they establish that he has his pistol, but then he doesn't have it at the end. And I think this is a good lesson as to why it's best not to screw with the formula. You know, like just <laughs> just do what Doyle says, because if he has a gun, then certainly he would have taken it on that most dangerous of walks. But he, right. because he, we have to make him conveniently not have one, then it just suddenly doesn't make any sense. Right. You know, if there's if there is a bad category, that has to go in there. Or just, you know, follow the thread. At least put the gun in his hand and have him drop it or something. Right. I mean, <laughs> he's walking home alone with the Hound of the Baskervilles and he owns a gun. Well, this is literally a moment of Chekhov's gun. Yeah. We've shown the gun two or three times, and then when he needs it, he doesn't have it. Right. They did get some interesting shots of the hounds here, you know, especially its legs. And like the music is great and they do set it up to be quite ominous. The phosphorescence is strangely effective to me, even though it's kind of dated. There's moments. There's moments. Yeah, where it works. there's moments. Yeah. But then the dinner, I know there's not a lot about it in the original story, but it had this like possibility for a very intense altercation between Sir Henry and Stapleton or Tabori and Faulkner. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like watching them could have been the actual climax. Would have been worth our time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But instead, we just see it through Watson's POV through the window, and it's over. Mm-hmm. We see them take a drink, and then Stapleton's like, excuse me for a minute. And then Sir Henry's walking home, and, and it's just home. already done. Yeah. <laughs> and even yeah. the scene where Holmes and them are driving up in the in the cart, the one important line from that whole scene is given in a wide shot while they're in the cart and no one's lips are moving, which he goes, Watson, you go to the house and we'll stay back here. Like, I've missed that so many times. Like, I, yeah. they show up and then Watson's by himself. It's like, it's just so disjointed. It, it bothers me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not the only one. Trevor Bowen was very unhappy about that situation. So yeah, most of the time things are not shot in chronological order, sequential order. But maybe this was, and maybe they just literally ran out of money at the end. I, d- yeah. I don't know for sure. It's just such a shame. Th- there was one of the adaptations that had uh, Richard E. Grant, mm-hmm. and this scene was like almost the climax of the movie. And, and actually, their hound, I think, was even more effective. But yeah. I would have loved to see these two actors go at it. You know, even if it was all made up and it was short, it was just, it would have been something. Right. But instead, the entire climax of this hour and 41 minute movie is less than 20 seconds long, which I timed. From the time Holmes notices the hound and he fires his first shot to the time the hound is dead is 20 seconds. It's just... Ugh. Well, one of my biggest concerns about this the early scenes where Stapleton is following Sir Henry in town is that, you know, in other adaptations, he, t- he takes a gun and takes a few shots at Sir Henry, which mm-hmm. makes sense because if he can kill him in London, then he's scot free when he gets back to Grimpen. Right. But if he's dining alone with his mortal enemy, why doesn't he just <laughs> kill him there and throw his body in the bog? I mean, you know, or or feed his body to the hound and then make it look like it was done. You know, instead of like right. dragging him to the house while his sister is tied up in the basement and, and potentially, you know, uh, it's just too many loose ends. Yeah, exactly. So I think the point is, I appreciate. A slow burn movie. Mm. But I just feel like we aren't rewarded for any of the slow burn. We're just getting the slow burn. I think Brian Mills, just frankly, you know, I, I think gothic horror wasn't his bread and butter. Yeah. You know, I, th- I think he just wasn't the right guy for this particular one. But we'll come back to that. For now, what I'd like to do is talk about the voice acting of The Hound. Sure. <laughs> because this is one of those things that uh, once you really listen to it, let's just say... I mean, sadly, it's just kind of laughable. And no offense to the voice actor, Percy Edwards, but, I mean, when the Hound attacks Sir Henry, it's like a cartoon is attacking him. It's it's really <laughs> strange. Yeah, it's a little strange. It's like the ultimate moment in the film, and you've got a guy going... I would say that Christopher Tabori in that moment is really effective. Oh, he is very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hearing him thrashing and, like, screaming, it's like <laughs> he saves that moment, you know? At least yeah. at least that's there, and it's not just the hound. No, he, considering he's acting with a fake stuffed animal, he does an amazing job, no, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think there is... And absolutely the most chilling moment in this episode and maybe the entire series Mm -hmm. because it's kind of actually disturbing, which is Stapleton's death. Yeah. The music adds to it. 
strangely, the cutaway, to, even to the cutaway to the gargoyle at Baskerville Hall mm-hmm. kind of evokes this feeling of like the exorcist. Yeah. And then the expression on his face and his vocal performance, even though most of it was cut out, you can just tell this would have been absolutely blood curdling. And I wonder if somebody was just like, that's way too much. Well, I mean, to quote uh, James Faulkner, that's an actor, honey. I mean, like, you know, he's, 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 he's acting, he's doing, he's doing it, man. You know, he's really selling that thing. Yeah. As to the cutaway of the statue, I feel like we're just lucky that one worked. Right. Because frankly, that was probably like, we need to get take one and take two and put them together. And we didn't shoot anything, people. What about that statue we shot in the intro? That'll work. Throw that in there. Yeah, but if it was a stationary shot, it wouldn't have worked. Right. It's the fact that it's this zoom in on this slightly demonic thing. And it's like, it does work. Yeah. And then we're in this close up. Yeah. I mean, watching this multiple times really made me think, kind of opposite of what you said, that there might even be a two-hour version of this episode locked up in the Granada vaults. I think what needs to happen is, if someday we adapt this, it needs to be a three-hour. It it needs to be a three-part, you know, thing, because every adaptation is so different, and, you know, they pick and choose things. And and frankly, I will say this, though, of of the ones I watched, I watched six or seven, and I know you watched some different ones, Yeah. um, and there's there's ones I've seen that I didn't rewatch. Frankly, I feel like most of the adaptations actually try to use as much of Doyle as they can. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised at how much gets lifted right off the page, which I think is a testament to how good the story is. But I think you got to do it all. You can't just pick and choose. You can't go, well, we're limited to 90 minutes, people. What what are the parts we're going to choose? No, no, no. You got to do it all. Yeah. It's got to be three, maybe four hours long <laughs> if you're going to do this right. There's so many little threads that come together with the Doyle story and the Doyle-isms. Right. We haven't even talked about Mortimer's dog. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do we give away a spoiler for the book? Well, I mean, in, in the story, his dog ends up a victim of the hound or maybe just a victim of Stapleton. We never really know. Maybe Stapleton killed the dog and fed it to the hound or maybe it was lost in the mire. We, we never know, but definitely a, a, a pretty harsh detail that Granada chose to leave out. Yeah, but it's also like that's an emotional moment that got cut out. Yeah. And it's also the fact that it's the hound of the Baskervilles and then there's a dog in it. You know what I mean? Like, it's like another little Doyleism. Yeah. And it's just missing. But it does show you that Doyle has a lot of very complex ideas that kind of thread together. And if you start messing with them, it just falls apart. Right. I would like to at least someday get James Faulkner's his vocal performance restored. Because, I mean, he says, <laughs> you know, sweet Jesus. It's like, I think we could live with that these days. And I think it would add so much. Yeah. It's like a satisfying end. It's so good. No, it, I, I think it's one of the most brutal things in the in the whole Granada series. In the is whole his death series, scene. I think it's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of things that are different than in the story, Jeremy is very open with hugging everyone who gets hurt in this one. <laughs> yeah, you know, I noticed that too. I mean, I didn't, and everybody's really into hugging him. Yeah, but the question that comes to mind is. Is this a little too much Jeremy and a little mm. too little Holmes? You know what I'm saying? Like, it, I think this is a moment where the director maybe should have said, that's not what Sherlock Holmes would do, Jeremy. I, I know you want to do that, but that's not what he would do. Yeah. You know, and, and nobody said that. And and it's fine, but it's just, it's like, I mean, think back to Abby Grange when Holmes recoils from Lady Brackenstall and, you know, how important that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even in the early script, it wasn't this way. I mean, in the early script, when they find Beryl Stapleton, Watson is the one who cuts her free and attends to her, and Holmes doesn't even look at her. Holmes just walks around the room looking for clues and evidence, and that's Sherlock Holmes. Well, yeah, Watson has a relationship, too. Yeah, exactly, right. She's never seen Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, so Jeremy, like, you know, (laughs) is having so much emotional feeling for this woman who he's never even met before— it's, yeah. I mean, again, it's Jeremy. I mean, we know it is. We know it's Jeremy. He, he was a lover. You know what I mean? He was, he was a wonderful human being. It's true. I, I think there's like precedence in the series though. Cause like this happens a lot. I, I seem to remember like Lady Frances Carfax, the same kind of thing happens. Well, moving forward, it does start to happen more. Yeah. 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 I will say though, and I, I know I've said it before, but I, I just love the ending look between Sir Henry and Beryl Stapleton Mm-hmm. You know, when when they've defeated the Hound and they're both beat up and they're both there together. And it's just, it's so genuine and it's so full of love from like both actors. It just, it lifts my heart. I mean, honestly, again, I come back to the thing where it's just the acting in this is is what really yeah. elevates it for me. 
um, in spite of its flaws, the performances, y- you can't not watch them. You know, they're, yeah. they're just, they're just great. I don't think you could top the performances in terms of all the Hound adaptations. I think these are definitely the best performances. I think everything around them suffers, unfortunately. Right. And it's, it's just, it's a shame. Like I feel bad for the actors. <laughs> yeah. So the mystery is solved. They wrap up on Baker Street in the Abbey Treasure shot. Yep. He, Holmes is already shouting at Watson. And then we get the final moment of Holmes driving his own cart, uh, which, you know, always seems a little off to me that he'd just be driving himself around. But I guess he has done it in the show before, and it makes it makes for a nice shot. Mm-hmm. Well, and then we get the final credit sequence of the Baker Street footage from season one. And, you know, it's nice to see that scene play out. I wish it ran a little longer. I think it would have been superb if they, like, ran through the entire credit sequence. You know what I mean? Like, if they had shot that for, like, five minutes... Yeah. And uh, we could have just gotten a little bit more than w- what we've seen before. But uh, but it's still it's still nice to see. Yeah, but really dissecting all the shots that were included in the Hound episode, I really think they only did blocking for, you know, so many carriages to cross. A couple minutes. Yeah, so I think it could have only been 30 seconds at the most. Sure. Because all those shots, every shot was the same action. It was just from different angles. So That's cool. It, I'm glad we got it. It's Like you said, it's nice that it's in there. But wait, there's more, or at least there might have been. In our working script, we have an entirely different ending. Hmm. Was it Mortimer that gave Selden the lobotomy? No, but that would have been a nice twist. Um, (laughs) Check this out. So as they sit in the Abbey Treasure shot and Watson is recounting everything to Holmes, Watson says, and the boot, he stole it presumably to have an article of Sir Henry's clothing to set the hound on him. Holmes says, Yes, and that is why the new boot would not do. Sir Henry had not worn it. Come, Watson, we are invited for four o'clock. Cut to interior Northumberland Hotel. A palm court, much Victorian greenery, and a small orchestra. Holmes, Watson, Dr. Mortimer, and Sir Henry Baskerville have been taking tea. It is now being cleared by a maid. Sir Henry is pale, withdrawn, and seems to find difficulty in concentrating his attention. Watson says, And so you leave tomorrow? Baskerville says, What? Oh, oh, yes, 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 we do. Do we not, Mortimer? We leave tomorrow, do we not? Mortimer says, we do. The African Empress, bound for the Azores, and then back to the Mediterranean and Alexandria, Palermo and Corfu on the way. Baskerville says, we shall be away all winter. Watson says, and do you intend to return to Baskerville Hall? Baskerville says, yes, I am determined to do that. Watson says, good, excellent. Watson is clearly worried by Sir Henry's condition. And we end on his inability to find anything else to say. Watson says, good, good. Cut to, later, interior foyer, Northumberland Hotel. Watson and Holmes are leaving through the hotel. As they pass through towards the front door, something takes Holmes's attention, but not Watson's. Cut to, the object of Holmes's attention, Beryl Stapleton stands at a stationary stall selecting a postcard. Meanwhile, Watson says, I dare say the sea air will do him good. Holmes says, I dare say so, Watson. Watson catches the mockery in Holmes's tone and is irritated. Watson says, This sea voyage is what the man needs, surely. His nerves are shot to pieces. As a doctor, that is what I would recommend. Most sensible of him to take Mortimer along. Holmes says, Most. Watson frowns. He wishes he knew the reason for Holmes's continued ironic tone. Holmes says, Now, my dear Watson, we have had a period of severe work... For one evening, I think, we may turn our thoughts into more pleasant channels. I have a box for Les Huguenots. Have you heard the Dereshkas? We might stop at Marcini's for a little dinner on the way. Holmes and Watson walk out of the door together. The end. Hmm. So yeah, that would have been the ending uh, had we stuck to that script, which I definitely think I like more. I mean, more is better, in my opinion, with any of these actors. It seems a little bit like too much of a wrap-up to me. Well, I think the reason they tried to do it is because in the book they make a big point about Sir Henry and Mortimer coming back to Baker Street and kind of having a you know a breakdown of everything that happened and Sir Henry is really damaged he's like mentally broken he's had like a mental breakdown mm. and they are they are setting off on a trip together but I don't think Beryl Stapleton's involved in any way so maybe this was their way of doing that but then also kind of answering the question of what did happen to Beryl Stapleton because the story doesn't really mm-hmm. answer that question in the end as far as I can recall. Or maybe she's sneaking around. She got another note she wants to send. Could be true. Well, let's go ahead and dive into the books for a moment. 
Hound of the Baskervilles appeared in the Strand magazine in monthly parts from August 1901 to April 1902. The first book edition was published by George Noons in 1902, just before the final installment appeared in the Strand, uh, which I like to think about, you know, people going, oh, God, it's 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 in a book. I can go out and buy that before the Strand comes out, and I'll know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we talked about Cartwright, the 14-year-old kid who goes to all the hotels in town and searches the waste paper baskets. I thought this was a cool little bit of, you know, detective busy work that we don't get too often from Holmes. Yeah. And I thought it was a nice touch that he had a 14-year-old kid do it, but he wasn't one of the irregulars, which, again, I just always feel like, why did Doyle invent the Baker Street irregulars if he's not going to use them for these things? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it just always feels like a missed opportunity to me. But also in the story, that's the kid he takes with him to the Moors and the one who brings him, you know, food and stuff. In the show, it looks like this kid's like eight years old or something. He looks pretty young. <laughs> yeah. I assumed he was like from the post office in the show. Could be. I thought from the story he was, I thought he worked at the hotel or something. In the story, yeah. In the story he worked at one of the hotels. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, then then he's kind of like, he's the hotel kid and he goes and searches the hotels. Sure. I mean, I think maybe they wouldn't let the irregulars into the hotel to search through their trash. I guess that's true. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Reading through the book, I mean, I feel like there wasn't that many annotations. There wasn't that many major changes in the story. Mm -hmm. So I only really had a few questions. The main one, I think, being other than to just make Watson a bumbler, why would he ever assume Dr. Mortimer's stick came from the local hunt? Yeah. Oh, I think that's just one of those, we got to write Watson a certain way, otherwise we don't have a deduction, you know? Yeah, I mean, mean, but like the deduction goes so far, you know, it's not, it's no bowler hat in the blue carbuncle, but... Well, plus Watson is a doctor, so you'd think he would probably make that connection. Exactly. Yeah. Right. No, no, yeah. I, I think, you know, he's a little bit more of a bumbler than even Doyle wanted to admit he wrote him. Yeah. There is one fun conspiracy theory in the Klinger book regarding the Barrymores making plans to smuggle Selden out of the country to South America. Mm. I don't remember in the show if they say it's South America where he's going, but in the story it does. Mm. And uh, Klinger writes, quote, How are they making arrangements to get their convict relation on board a ship bound for South America? Asks Brad Kefalver, quote, a pair of country servants do not have the connections to get a wanted criminal to a place half a world away. He proposes that Moriarty employed Selden, engineered <laughs> the prison break, and arranged the trip to South America. Sure, why not? Yeah, it's always Moriarty or Jack the Ripper. It's always one of them. Yeah. We haven't done any real hat chat in this episode, everybody's favorite segment. There is an annotation about Holmes's hat. Mm-hmm. This is when Holmes is on the moor. Watson says... In his tweed suit and cloth cap, he looked like any other tourist upon the moor, and he had contrived, with that cat-like love of personal cleanliness, which was one of his characteristics, that his chin should be smooth and his linen be as perfect as if he were on Baker Street. So it doesn't say deerstalker. Mm -hmm. It just says cloth cap. Yeah. Do we like that as a deerstalker? I think there's only a couple of times where it's referred to as a cloth cap, and so a lot of people do take that to be the deerstalker. Well, the, the annotation says this. Sidney Paget's daughter adds, As a young man, my father lived in the country, and it was during this time that he wore that surely now most famous of all hats, the deerstalker. Hmm. And the fact that he liked it and found it comfortable inspired him to depict Holmes wearing it in so many occasions. It's at least an answer to that. There's at least one answer to that. Nice. I, I, I do like that it doesn't get overused in the Granada series, but there you go. There's at least an explanation about the deerstalker. Yeah, for sure. There's another quirky note in the clinger. I'll just read. He states, It has delighted generations of Sherlockians that Laura Lyons was the playmate of the month in the February 1976 issue of Playboy magazine. Hugh Hefner, publisher of Playboy, in an interview with this editor, meaning Les Klinger, published in the Baker Street Journal, discussing his long affinity with Sherlock Holmes, stated for the first time that this was her real name, ending years of speculation. <laughs> so yeah wait I mean, a minute I'm confused by that there there was someone named Laura Lyons who was a playmate yeah exactly okay <laughs> yeah I mean I, I looked at this issue uh, of the Baker Street Journal uh, and, and it is an interesting read Hefner was actually a genuine Sherlock Holmes fan he actually told Klinger Holmes has been so very important to me and added after all 
I'm another guy who spent much of his time in his bathrobe smoking a pipe at home. There you go. Um, but <laughs> it's kind of fun that Les Klinger was the guy who got that interview. That's pretty funny. Yeah. One strange difference between the show and the story, Selden doesn't have a lobotomy in the story. He's just an escaped criminal. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they changed this, but we did receive an email about this, which I was going to save, but I'll just read it here. This is from a listener named Anne. She writes, Hi, Luke and Gus. This may not be particularly significant to some fans, but it stood out to me as I am a doctor with an interest in history. When watching The Hound, I noticed that they say the escaped convict Selden is said to have had some sort of medical procedure done to him in prison. It implies something along the lines of a lobotomy, and there is even a scar akin to a Frankenstein's monster on his forehead. Hmm. In fact, the first modern research on lobotomy to change personality was done by Gottlieb Burkhardt in Switzerland in 1891. There is no evidence of this ever being done in the judicial system, though at any point and certainly not in the 1880s to the 1890s. Not until well into the 20th century did some hospitals practice it on select patients throughout Europe. It was eventually superseded by developments in medication. I read the original story again, and this is not mentioned at all, so I'm at a loss as to why this was added, perhaps to try and explain why the convict's sister would help him. Anyway, I still love the show, and while it could have been done a little bit better, I don't think it's as poor as people make it out to be. Signed, Anne. Uh, well, thanks so much, Anne. Great information there. Yeah, I'm not really sure why they did that. I mean, I don't know. In my opinion, it doesn't really add anything. I guess it makes Selden a little more sympathetic. But mm. did did we need that? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why Trevor Bone did that. Maybe we should try to ask him next time we talk to him. <laughs> I mean, maybe the scar was just so that we can have some other kind of horror element in in the movie. Yeah, that's possible. Maybe they just felt like his character was so silent that giving him an excuse to be silent would add something. I don't know. Well, and also, like, why would he throw a rock at... Right. Maybe just because he seems so... Like, he seems dumb in the book. You right. You know, like, you <laughs> yeah. know, they're signaling each other, and it's not Barrymore, so I'm going to throw a rock at the guy. Yeah, it's a weird one, but it's definitely uh, a unique thing to the Granada show. It's not in any of the other adaptations. Yeah. So the Oxford Annotated points out that phosphorus is deadly poisonous to humans and dogs, so it was more likely barium sulfide. But I looked it up, and barium sulfide is also very poisonous, so I think this one we just have to suspend disbelief on. Is it poisonous to touch, though, or is it poisonous to eat? Well, I think it's just poison. I mean, a dog, if he's got it all over him, I mean, there's no way he's not going to lick it or, you know, breathe it or whatever. Sure. Maybe he didn't care at that point. Yeah, I don't know how well any of that glows either. I actually think I think in the Ian Richardson adaptation at the end, he says it's uh, some kind of phosphorescent barium sulfide. So like they actually changed it for for at least one of the adaptations. But uh, yeah, interesting. You know, th there's a moment in the story though where it talks about like he's glowing out of his mouth and eyes. Yeah, that I haven't seen, but like I was imagining that again. Like I feel like that'd be so effective horror right like if you imagine the dog got in the stuff and was eating it and it was just like his mouth was glowing like i i think there is a very effective hound movie waiting to be made yeah totally so we'll talk about how it stacks up against the rest of the granada series in a moment but how does it stand up to other film and television adaptations now, I mean, there, there, there's so many. I actually hoped to watch more, but I just couldn't carve out the time. So I watched like six or seven, I think. Which ones did you watch, Luke? I watched the both Peter Cushing versions. Mm -hmm. I watched the Basil Rathbone. I watched Ian Richardson. I watched the BBC Benedict Cumberbatch. There was a TV version in 2002, I think, mm -hmm. which had Richard E. Grant in it. Well, what were your overall thoughts? My overall thoughts were, after I watched about three or four of them, I feel like I got the whole story. I don't think any of them got it right, yeah, or any of them got all of the points. I don't think you can. Like, I don't, I don't think you could hit them no, all. Not, not in 90 minutes, no. No, but I feel like the Granada version is the best, mm -hmm. but with a lot of caveats. I feel like the two Peter Cushing versions, if you could put them together, I think you have a really good one. Mm -hmm. The Basil Rathbone is the best in terms of atmosphere because hmm. I feel like they, they actually photographed the Moors in an interesting way and it feels eerie and moody and it's the only one that does to me. There's other ones that got the hound right or, or better, you know, that it actually feels a little scary. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. what did you think? 
I don't know. I mean, I watched almost all the same ones you did. I didn't watch the Benedict Cumberbatch, but I watched the Basil Rathbone. And again, it's good for its time. You know, it's they add stuff like a seance, but, you know, it's fine. It's just on the gentle side. The Cushing and Lee one, the Hammer movie, I love Hammer movies. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like this is a particularly good Hammer movie. I don't know. It's It's got production values, but... I don't know. There's a lot of liberties taken, and I just, I just didn't love it. I mean, I am a huge Peter Cushing fan. I mean, he's one of my favorite actors, yeah. and so I prefer the other one, the the BBC TV one with Nigel Stock, just because Cushing is great in it, and it's, it, I think it's the most canonical of all the single ones. The problem with that one is, oh my God, it's so cheap. Mm. It's so cheap. It's just, it's, it's made for TV. It's shot on tape. It, it's so bizarrely cheap. It, it's, it's like, you know, there's boom poles in every shot. There's, you know, mistakes all over the place, but at least they tried. I found myself surprised how much I liked the Ian Richardson one, mm-hmm. uh, Mableton films from 83. That one was, this is the lawsuit that happened when Michael Cox was trying to get the show made and Mapleton Films had gone out and made, you know, a couple of movies with Ian Richardson trying to do their own thing. Right. I mean, considering that was made for TV, I thought it was great. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of people in it. I mean, uh, Nicholas Clay's in it. Ronald Lacey plays Inspector Lestrade. Denholm Elliott is Mortimer. Um, and the Hound doesn't totally suck in that one, <laughs> I thought. Is that the one that has the glowing eyes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there was only one that had glowing eyes. It, just that subtle thing was even effective. Yeah. It was. It had its moments, for sure. I mean, I, I would say that was probably my second favorite one, to be honest. Even though, I got to be honest, I really do not like Ian Richardson as Holmes. He is just too happy. I agree there. I think that's the thing that like crystallized for me, is that watching all of these, it's really well-trod ground, but I, I feel like... Jeremy definitely rises to the top of the pile. Yeah. And I think Basil Rathbone rises to the top of the pile and Peter Cushing. Yeah. I think they all kind of have their thing. I just feel like the Granada series just got the most things right. Well, speaking of the top of the pile, we should probably talk about the bottom of the pile. And I will tell you this. I watched one that you didn't watch, the Matt Frewer, Kenneth Welsh, 2001. Yeah, I skipped that one. Yeah. Good choice. <laughs> Someone online described Matt Frewer's Holmes as Ace Ventura pretending to be Sherlock Holmes, and that's oh, no. what it is. It's frankly painful to watch. It is seriously painful, which is tragic because they had some pretty some pretty good production values. I think the budget on it was like four point five million. They spent seven hundred thousand of that on Baker Street sets. Hmm. Kenneth Welsh, who played Wyndham Earl in Twin Peaks, he's he's really not bad as Watson, considering he's Canadian. He's pretty good. Yeah. But it just the whole thing feels like it's made for stupid Americans. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like it it just feels like an after school special where they over explain everything to death that's unfortunate and i like matt frewer i know you do and there's four of these that they made with matt frewer oh geez i will not be watching any of them well the other one i skipped had a zero percent rotten tomato which i don't judge anything off but it was the dudley moore version oh god yeah <laughs> i watched the trailer and i was like I, I don't know if i can finish the trailer no was... i almost i almost picked it up on blu-ray and then i read the reviews and it was like you know the only one that's worse than the Will Ferrell movie is this one. And I was like, oh, no thanks. I don't need that. Yeah. Okay, well, before we cast our votes, any good, bad, or amazing Jeremy moments we passed over? I feel like there was so much good in this episode, but it just kind of got confused and and lost. But in all these other adaptations, I found myself wanting either more gothic horror or more of a traditional home story. Mm Mm-hmm. And this one was really neither. It felt like we were watching a different movie. If this was a period drama or a period romance, all of the aspects in this episode succeed. Mm-hmm. But I just feel like as this home story, I don't know, it just, it just kind of fell apart. I don't know, is that good or is that a bad point? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a valid a valid point of view. I mean, as you said, there's so much good and bad. Uh, you know, there, there's so many ups and downs in this thing. It's like if we're going to talk about the good and the bad, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'd prefer to focus on the good stuff because... I think this one has a, a pretty bad rap, and and I don't think it deserves it. But I do think if like like us, you know, if, if you haven't watched all these other adaptations and you're just comparing it to you know the Blue Carbuncle or the greatest that Granada has to offer, right. this one, you know, maybe it doesn't add all the way up. But there's some good moments here. I mean, like I, I the moment where Watson comes back to Baker Street and he's coughing about the poisonous atmosphere, and, and Holmes says, mm-hmm. "I see you've been at the club all day," and Watson just says, "How do you know that?" 
And then Holmes doesn't even bother to reply. Watson opens the window. Watson doesn't care. Have you got a cold, Watson? Yeah, in the book, this is another of Holmes' very involved deductions about how he knows Watson was at the club. But Watson just dismisses it here in the show, which I really like because maybe it's unintentional, maybe it was due to cuts, but it just gives them this friendly feeling like, oh, here he goes again, he's going to give me another deduction, I don't care, open the window. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like It's just like Holmes is obviously this omnipotent genius, but Watson has heard it all before. So like to me, like little moments like that, that really kind of solidify their friendship. That's what I like in this episode. You know, I I like those little moments. I I like that that line kind of goes both ways though, too, because he's going, yeah, it's another deduction, but Holmes is also going like, see, you you know, you've been at the club and it's like, I don't even want to explain how I know that because Mm -hmm. I've been in Devonshire in spirit, you know? And like, it's almost a throwaway thing, but it creates this mood. It's it's just nice. Yeah. All right. It's time for Persian slippers. Who's going to go first? I'll go first, but I reserve the right to change my final scoring <laughs> until you've given your score. All right. Okay. I don't tend to always agree with what everybody else thinks. Like a lot of my favorite movies get low ratings and a lot of the movies I think are terrible get high ratings. But I do like to kind of see where I fall in the in that kind of temperature gauge. So I check IMDb typically just because it's people rating it. Rotten Tomatoes is just a percentage of how many reviewers who, you know, watch movies for free, what they thought of a movie. So I, I, I don't take that into account. That said, you kind of have to compare this hound to every other hound, but you also have to compare it to the rest of the series. And that's just that's just tricky. Mm-hmm. The weird thing is what everybody else thinks. And the Sherlock magazine released a poll. Out of all of the episodes, The Hound came number seven in terms of everyone's favorite episode, yeah. which really surprised me. And But maybe that just tells you that I'm not necessarily perfectly in touch with everybody. So it's hard because I think really pe- people really love this episode, but it's not my favorite story. We've said what we've said about the execution. It's a little clunky, and I fear I'll be burned in effigy for my score, but I think this episode deserves its criticisms. Mm-hmm. And I think it's something we all love. It's a good friend. It <laughs> deserves an honest opinion. Yeah. I'm going to give it 7.2. Not bad. A solid C. I thought about giving it less. <laughs> 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 but I, but that's not really fair either because it is really well done for, for the parts that were well done. Sure. You know, it's, it's just not perfect. And, and, and it bothers me. No. Yeah. It pains me to say it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what you think. Well... This one was really hard for me, too. Uh, I have to be honest. I I went in having felt for a long time that this one was very flawed. And that feeling of missed opportunity has always really made me sad because, like someone said, it's the best of the stories. It's the best homes of a generation. It's Granada. It should have been a complete home run. But we keep saying the same thing. You know, the execution is just flawed. It just doesn't come together in some intangible way. The the magic is missing. The constituent parts are all there, which is why I hate being so critical of it. Right. It's just that movie magic thing. I mean, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, for, for every Casablanca, there were 50 other movies that came out in 1942 that just didn't reach those heights. Mm. And, you know, budget surely played a role. I think that's at least half of the blame uh, that can be laid there, at least. But it's just hard to say how much of this is also Brian Mills. Because if he had wanted to incorporate gothic horror elements, I think that could have been done without any additional money. You know, just lighting differences or camera angles or or pacing changes. I mean, yeah. then again, you know, would more money have made for a better, more set piece? Maybe. Mm-hmm. But... Maybe not. I mean, if if you're shooting inside and trying to make it look like outside in the 1980s, it's never really going to look much better than that. And, you know, maybe money would have meant Colin Jevons could have been there. Maybe more money could have afforded a better hound paint job. I mean, we can go around and around. But I really hate to sound like an entitled fanboy, but it just disappoints me knowing that they had the skills and that they didn't knock it all the way out of the park. So... All that said, on the flip side of that coin, seriously, after watching (laughs) six or seven other adaptations in a row, as we've both said, I have brand new respect for this one. Yeah. Because you're right. It is a hard story to get right on screen, apparently. And I kind of agree with Michael Cox. I don't think anyone has ever got it right. I, you know, but we have the cast of a lifetime in this one. Every actor is world class. 
But then there's also Jeremy, who I don't know how to say it. We know he made a decision to soften yeah. or warm Sherlock around this time. And between that and his struggles, I just feel like his homes in this one is a little too gentle. And maybe it's just by comparison to previous Jeremy Brett moments, but it it shows. It shows, and it wasn't that way in the first draft of the script. And I honestly really don't know if I like or dislike the change. It's just different. And that's what makes it hard is that we know he's struggling, you know, and, and I, I'm i going to get sappy for a moment, but it, it makes me sad to know what he's going through and to see it in his face and in his eyes. And I guess, you know, that's my own fault <laughs> for being a super fan and digging too deep, yeah. but it also makes me love the man all the more for overcoming it. So it, it's just this one more than any other one. It's just a supremely mixed bag for me. But at the end of the day, as an episode of the Granada Sherlock Holmes series, where does it fall? I'm just going to go with my gut, and I am going to give this one a 7.9 out of 10. Okay. Which is a high C. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a worthy piece of work, but it could have been even more. It should have been. It should have been the hound for the ages. I agree. And I don't know. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that, I guess. That's the exact sentiment. It should have been the hound for the ages. Yeah. And unfortunately, it just wasn't. The previous work on this series is just impeccable. And then the fact that this one was let down yeah. is just that much more of a shame. And I, I do blame the money. I do blame the budget. I, I feel like that's the main culprit. And then Brian Mills, you know, the choices he made just, you know, just yeah. from his own personal choices, I think that was the second culprit. I think the budget is definitely Granada's own Grimp and Meyer of its own making. Right. It's like once you fall into the budget hole, you, you're not getting out. There's things you can't do without money. Exactly. Okay, well, we've been away a while. Let's check in with Mrs. Hudson for any housekeeping items we might have missed. Let's dive into the biggest item on the chalkboard, Brett Con 2024. Yes. I hope most of our listeners are aware of this by now, but just in case, and for those who would like an update, BrettCon, our celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Granada Sherlock Holmes series, is taking place in Guildford, just outside of London, on Saturday, May 25th, 2024. And tickets are on sale now at our website, SherlockPodcast.com, or you can just Google BrettCon Ticket Tailor, and it'll take you to the ticketing site. This will be an all-day event packed with cast and crew members from the original Granada show, all gathering together to celebrate the series and share their memories of Jeremy and the show we all love. And for us fans to hang out together, make new friends, and just share the love of Jeremy Brett Sherlock. And we have so many wonderful guests joining us. Luke, uh, why don't you tell us a few of, of the people we can expect to meet there? Yes. Well, if you've lasted this long through the Hound of the Baskervilles episode, you will be happy to hear that Sir Henry Baskerville himself will be joining us, Christopher Tabori. Yeah. I, that makes me so happy. We've just confirmed that Betsy Brantley will be there. Elsie Cubitt from The Dancing Men. Elsie Cubitt. We have Oliver Tobias, Captain Croker from the Abbey Grange. Mm -hmm. We've got Allison Skilbeck from the Naval Treaty. We've got Matthew Solon, who is the unhappy John Hector McFarlane from the Norwood Builder. We've got Jack Claff, the Honorable Philip Green from The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax. We've got the costume designer for the whole series, Esther Dean. We've got the costume designer, Kate Turner, who worked on Hound and a number of other episodes. We've got Ross Simmons from The Blue Carbuncle. And we've got David Carson, the director of The Blue Carbuncle, and we'll be doing a special screening of The Blue Carbuncle. And we're getting together a number of cast and crew, and it's going to be a, just an amazing reunion. Yeah. It, we're going to have other directors. We're going to have Granada crew members. There'll be other actors we still have yet to announce. It's just going to be amazing. And we're going to raise a glass of brandy to anybody who can't be there with us. <laughs> but we hope you can join us. Yeah. And, you know, we'll be having some unofficial meetups yeah. before and after the event on Friday uh, in Guilford and also on Sunday we're going to be arranging a kind of walking tour with a f of a few of the shooting locations in the in the London area so tickets are going quick now uh, so if you'd like to join us please do get your soon also to people who've already bought a ticket especially to the VIP members a big thank you but we should say we would like you to check your junk mail filter or your email preferences because we have been emailing certain people trying to get some data back so Keep an eye on that for us. We are also reaching out to people 
anyone who worked on the show. If you've got props or any related ephemera, we are going to be making a little exhibit of props and costumes. Our friend Jim, who's a listener of the, of the podcast, who works at the British Museum, he's going to be helping us to make sure all those items are safe and secure. We're going to have a room for vendors. If you have something Sherlock related, you might want to sell it, you know, you can get in touch with us. We've had certain people who are donating items to the event so that we can raise money for the charity, which is uh, Mind UK, which is something we thought Jeremy would be, get behind. We're going to have an auction. Um, it's just going to be, oh, there's so much. No, it's going to be great. And uh, if this event is a success, which it's shaping up to be, uh, we think this will be the first of many such gatherings. So um, we hope to see you there for Brett 2024. Also, one announcement, um, our Sherlockian Relics collections, both volumes now are sold out. We are currently working on making new sets of those, and we are going to have both sets on display at BrettCon. And we, we are going to be making both sets available again after the event. We have kept both listings active on our store website at SherlockPodcast.com. So if you're interested, you can pre-order a set now, and we will begin shipping them once they're available, probably in June. Cool. Just briefly, the next big update is for our film, The Vast Lonesome. I always wonder if our listeners get worn out hearing about our other projects, but we do get a lot of emails about it. So just briefly, we've wrapped phase one of uh, photography on the film, and we are now moving into phase two, which is, you know, reshoots and post-production, that kind of stuff. We are still looking for the last bit of finishing funds and could really use your help. We're hoping there might be a few interested partners out there who would like to rally with us and help us get this across the finish line. If you'd like to get involved with Luke and I on this project, we'd be happy to talk with you about it. And you can reach us at contact at SherlockPodcast.com. And if you'd like to see a taste of the work in progress, we do have a top secret teaser trailer, which really is just meant for investors, but we have posted it on our website at vastlonesome.com slash teaser. And this will link to a password protected Vimeo video. But if you'd like to see what we're up to, you can enter the password Sherlock with a capital S and see just a tiny little bit of footage that we have assembled so far. Fair warning, this is a rough, you know, internal assembly of footage not meant for wide release or anything like that. But we're pretty proud of what we've accomplished so far, especially, you know, at this scale. So, so check it out. And if you'd like to consider supporting the film, either as a donor or an investor, uh, we do have a 501c3 for a tax deduction as well. Please reach out. And thanks to everyone who already did. Yeah. On to some Sherlock news. This is a quick shout out to the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere podcast. They were kind enough to have us on again. This time we talked about Brett Con. Mm -hmm. Myself, Gus, and David, our UK producer, we all had a great time. We spoke to Scott and Bert over there. Always fun to talk to them. We also got to talk about Hound a little bit, other Sherlockian items, and we got into some weird other things and, and you know, who knows? <laughs> you can find it wherever you get your podcasts or at their website, IHearOfSherlock.com. Cool. Some of you might recall the last Potter and Potter auction of the Robert Hess Sherlockiana collection. Well, while we were away, a second auction of the Robert Hess and Roy Pilot collections was held at Potter and Potter, and this one was even more crazy than the last one. I think a, a lot more people were aware of part two or, or something because the prices that things went for were just astronomical this time by comparison. Mm. You might remember last time I was able to get the show scripts and a few other items. This time, I had my heart set on just one item, which was a collection of audio cassette tapes of random Jeremy Brett-related things, everything from radio interviews to theater performances to public service announcements and more. And I thought for sure I would have no problem getting this for under a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand at the outside. No, it went for $3,600. Wow. Yeah. The big reason I wanted it was because it included audio of The Secret of Sherlock Holmes, the play uh, with Jeremy and Edward. And there is an audio copy out there on YouTube, but I hoped this might be a different night of the play, you know, or a better recording, or, you know, maybe some of the other tapes would include things that we could share with the podcast audience. But alas, it went a bit rich for my blood, um, yeah. especially now that we're putting all our pennies into BreadCon and the movie. So I had to let that go. The only item I did win was Roy Pilot's collection of Les Klinger's Sherlock reference library, which I only bid on because basically it was the same price as buying the set new, hmm. and uh, some of them are, are still waiting to be reprinted. So 
I pulled the trigger on that one, and to my surprise, when they arrived, they were all autographed by Les Klinger, each one. Wow. And uh, yeah, many of them were also autographed by whoever wrote the foreword to each individual volume, Sherlockian scholars and the like. Mm. They're not just autographed, by the way. They're very cool, like personal inscriptions. So that's neat. I did get those. There really wasn't a ton of Jeremy related stuff in this one by comparison, though they did have Sidney Paget's personal dressing gown, which went for, do you want to guess, Luke? 17000 <laughs> Only $4,080. Oh, that's a bargain. Yeah, not too bad. There were some other things, some personal items from Jeremy's estate, some newspaper clipping collections. And some of the folks who won, I, I won't name names uh, for their privacy, have been kind enough to share some of that stuff with us, which I, you know, it's great because it'll certainly help the podcast research moving forward. Yeah. But if whoever won those audio tapes is out there <laughs> and you'd like to share, I'd be more than happy to digitize all of that for you yeah. uh, if you'd be willing to let us incorporate some of it into the show. So I don't know. If you're out there, feel free to reach out. And I actually had a brief interaction with Robert Hess in email and was hoping to get him uh, on the podcast, but uh, we, we've just been so ridiculously swamped lately. We just couldn't make that happen. But with luck, you know, maybe we still can down the road. I'm sure he has a lot of Sherlockian stories um, that he could tell. For sure. The latest issue of the Sherlock Holmes magazine just came out. Uh, which celebrates the 40th anniversary of the Granada show. Yeah. They also have the results of their online polls, which show not just the fan favorite top voted episodes, but they also have the data broken out by country and some just very interesting little nuggets of, of data about what everyone likes and where they're from. Yeah. There's even a little piece about Brett Con in there. And as always, just great stuff about Jeremy and the series. So if you haven't already, Pick up your copy at sherlockholmesmag.co.uk. And if you can make it to BrettCon, you can even say hello to the folks at the magazine as well because they'll be joining us. And on the back cover, there's even a poster for BrettCon. What do you know? Yeah. Also, we've been sharing a lot of the BrettCon guest announcements and activities a few days early over on our Patreon. And we've got some big announcements coming up in the next few weeks. We'll also be sharing the full Hound interview episode early as well over there. So if you want more material or you like getting stuff a little bit sooner, consider supporting the podcast at patreon.com forward slash Sherlock podcast. One last item. A few months back, Life Magazine reissued their Sherlock Holmes issue, which they do every few years. I think it was out in 2017 and again in 2022 and again this year. But even though this is supposed to be an all-encompassing celebration of The Great Detective, in its nearly 100 pages, there is not a single reference to Jeremy Brett or the Granada series, hmm. which frankly I think is kind of a travesty. I mean, you got Robert Downey Jr. in there, you got Benedict Cumberbatch in there, but no Jeremy Brett. Come on, people. So yeah, I mean, you know, in their defense, I would say 75% of the magazine is is about Doyle and about the actual stories, and then and then you know it's just kind of peppered in with other things from TV and movies. But uh, some people in a number of Sherlock Holmes Facebook groups started a letter writing campaign to at least, you know, raise awareness to these publishers so that uh, with any luck, a future reprint will hopefully be revised to include Mr. Brett. There you go. Okay, well, it's time to visit the mantle and check under the jackknife for listener telegrams. Okay, well, our first telegram wasn't really a telegram, but friend of the show, Stefan Weishaupt, who you might remember as the saintly figure who shared the Abbey Treasure video with us. Mm. Well, Stefan posted on Facebook in response to our questions about the location of the missing plaque from 221B that the Abbey Bank took down when they moved, uh, never to be seen again. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out Stefan has it. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it looks like he has the original, but apparently even he is not 100% sure. He, he won it, actually, in the first Robert Hess auction that we were just talking about. And the coloring of it, it, it seems to be different than what you find in the photos online from when it was attached to the building. Mm. But if it's not the original, it certainly was made from the same mold. You know what I mean? It's, it's exactly the same plaque. Yeah. But I think this might be as close to a solution as we are ever likely to find on that mystery. So thanks again, Stefan, for, for letting us know. Yeah. We just received a very lovely message from Carol in Shanghai, who just recently found the series and is just now listening to the podcast for the first time and just finished the Speckled Band episode and asked after Dr. Poncho, my Speckled Band hunter. 
Mm-hmm. I'm happy to say he's here with me now as we record, snoring by my side, and his speckled band toy is still in one piece in the corner of my office. So thank you, Carol, for writing in. Our next telegram comes from Simon. He writes, hi, Luke and Gus. Hi, Simon. Do you know how to spot a genuine first edition of Hound of the Baskervilles? Well, there is a typo on page 13, specifically page 13, line 3, which mistakenly prints you instead of your. I've only just found this fact out and not surprisingly went to check my copy. Luckily, it has the typo. Hmm. Keep up the great work, gents. Simon. Thanks, Simon. Well, if you have a first edition, you are one lucky man. I looked this up, and uh, depending on the condition, of course, copies go for around five, six, ten, even twelve thousand dollars. Crazy. Actually, there's a collection of the original Strand issues with Hound in them on Abe Books right now. That's A B E Books for fourteen thousand five hundred dollars. So yeah, take care of that one, Simon. <laughs> um, you can put your kids through college, or maybe just a semester of college. Yeah. Okay, well, the next message comes from Mark Finlay-Smith, friend of the show and freelance writer and columnist for The Herald. Mark writes, I thought you might be interested in a book I've just finished reading which suggests the real inspiration for Conan Doyle's story at a place not far from where I am now, in Scotland. Here it is, an extract from an excellent biography of the British Prime Minister Archibald Primrose, 5th Earl of Rosebery, by Leo McKinstry. Quote, As well-known figures in society... Lord Rosebery and his wife may have been the inspiration for certain fictional characters. Perhaps the most interesting fictional link is between Rosebery and the Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a friend and occasional traveling companion of Rosebery. There was an old legend in the Primrose family that if any tragedy was coming to the laird, an unseen hound would be heard baying from the shoreline near Barnboogle, a castle on Rosebery's Scottish estate. It was said that on the night Hannah, Lord Rosebery's wife, died, a mournful bark echoed through the November night. Knowing Conan Doyle's fascination with the supernatural, Rosebery probably told him the myth of the Barnboogle Hound, thereby providing the original inspiration for the most famous of all Sherlock Holmes' stories. In support of this thesis, there is a letter from Conan Doyle to Rosebery, dated the 22nd of March, 1902, which reads, I am so glad the hound amused you. It is its best justification. Barnboogle is on the east coast of Scotland, not far from Edinburgh, and I believe you can even hire it out. Keep up the good work, Mark. Uh, well, thank you, Mark. That is very interesting. I don't think I saw anything about Rosebery in the annotated editions. Hmm. And I don't know, that would seem to conflict with other reports. But then again, it's entirely possible both legends played a part in Doyle's mind. I mean, maybe it's the same dog. <laughs> I think it's funny. I mean, the supporting documentation, the, the letter that Conan Doyle wrote to him that says, I'm glad it amused you. That's its best justification. I don't think that uh, supports the thesis, really. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think he's just saying, like, I'm glad it amused you. That's the best reason I could have written it. You know, yeah. I don't know. There, there, there's probably scholars out there who have devoted their entire lives to just the Hound of the Baskervilles <laughs> yeah. uh, who, who, who may know all the angles. Sure. And, uh, you know, if any of those people are out there, please write in and let us know. Uh, but maybe, I mean, uh, possible Mark has uh, uncovered something that's just not in the literature. I don't remember seeing a mention of that in any of the annotated books, but I I could be crazy. Well, I like the idea that people are doing the research for us. Well, and by the way, a little <laughs> film trivia, Edward Hardwick actually played Lord Rosebery in Edward the hmm. the BAFTA-winning ITV series that was directed by John Gorey, who directed the Bruce Partington plans, and we actually talked to him about that briefly. It was, uh, I don't know, it was streaming on Netflix at one point. I'm not sure if it still is, but uh, it's definitely out there on DVD and other places if anybody wants to find Edward the VII. Hmm. The next telegram is from Chris. Hello, Gus and Luke. Hello, Chris. I only recently found your podcast, and I've been enjoying it immensely. I loved the series from a young age, and whenever I read the stories, I hear Jeremy Brett's voice in my mind. As I've been moving through your podcasts, I've been re-watching the episodes on YouTube, and that's been a great joy. I must admit to falling down a rabbit hole and even found the Kindle version of Bending the Willow, which was a beautiful book. I'd love to read the other books you reference, but I've not found them yet. If you have any ideas of where to look, I would be most appreciative. They aren't easy to come by. Uh, I'll pause there. Yeah, no easy answer to that, really. Most of them are out of print, but A Books, A-B-E Books, is always a good place to start. And as we've mentioned, a study in celluloid should be coming back into print via Wessex Press... Uh, Gasogene Books very soon. But back to the email, 
while in the Sherlock Holmes rabbit hole, I came across this video on YouTube of a young Benedict Cumberbatch praising Jeremy. It's quite short, but very interesting to watch, and Cumberbatch makes some interesting observations. I'll just go ahead and play that clip right here. Very much part of my cultural upbringing with Holmes was watching Jeremy Brett and Basil Rathbone. Jeremy Brett principally on television when I was old enough to, and he was also a family friend. And um, uh, to me, they're the two superlative incarnations on, on screen of, of Holmes of old. Um, and while I didn't want to derive anything from their performances, there are certain Holmesian qualities which are there in the book, his physicalities, which are very well described at certain points, whether it's his pose for thinking, his, uh, he very often places his hands under his chin in the prayer position, or sits on his haunches, or a particular sort of just look of distraction and concentration, which Watson can't, can't read into, and mood swings and the mercurial nature of the character you know there's there's an awful lot that brett and rathbone i think did su sublimely well Br rathbone had a great deal of humor brett brought a massive um amount of darkness to it and um well i think both exist it's it's a really happy balance in our version i think with i mean jeremy would be the first to admit his his psychosis i mean he was a manic depressive um sort of fitted in with the role in quite a dangerous, toxic way, and it kind of took over by the end. And um, that skewed, uh, I mean, it made it, it made an extraordinary bit of television, but it kind of skewed um, the original intention, I think, of what they were trying to do with it. Chris goes on to say, it's inevitable that the creators and artists we love and admire pass on, and normally that isn't an issue when enjoying their work after their death. I'd say that holds true for this series, and yet I feel a sadness at times knowing more about Jeremy's struggles during the later seasons. He gave his all, and his fans will always be grateful, and I'd like to believe that he'll live on in the memories of his fans as the one and only Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Be well, Chris. P.S. I wish I could join you all in the U.K. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Thank you for the clip and for the kind words. I think that interview with Cumberbatch was right in the middle of the Sherlock show, you know, when it when it was released. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know how close Jeremy Brett was with Cumberbatch's family. That was interesting. There's got to be more stories there that no one's asked him. I mean, if Life Magazine doesn't even know Jeremy exists, <laughs> you know, maybe they didn't know that when they interviewed him. But see, I also got to wonder how true some of the things were that he said. I, I just mean, you know, if he knew Jeremy at all, the opposite of what he said about the darkness of Jeremy towards the end was actually true because, he, you know, he was more dark as Sherlock Holmes in the beginning and less later. Yeah. I don't know. And maybe we'll someday we'll get a chance to interview him. I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch would have only been, what, 12 or 15 when Jeremy died? So Yeah, I, something I like know. that. Well, and yeah, as to the other point, we had to make some tough decisions about where to hold uh, Brett Kahn. The truth is that, the, you know, almost all the cast and crew from the show are UK-based and, you know, many of them are getting up there in years and, Travel's a real issue, so we hope that if this one is a success and we can do another one, it might be held in the U.S., but, you know, we'll just have to see what the future brings. Yeah. The next note comes from Jane, who writes, Hello, Gus and Luke. Hi, Jane. I've been searching online for ways of marking the remarkable career and personality of Jeremy Brett, since it seems the BAFTA route may be closed to him. And I came across some information about a plaque in the Wyndham's Theater, where The Secret of Sherlock Holmes was staged, in the Circle Bar. It was unveiled by Edward Hardwick in 1995. Below a photo of Jeremy is a brass plaque that reads, Jeremy Brett, 1933 to 1995. Quote, I lost a friend whom I regarded as the best and wisest man I've ever known. End quote. Signed, The Regulars. Yeah, I'll just pause there. I did not know about this, um, and I was no. really happy to learn about this. Thank you, Jane. There's a few photos of this on the internet. I'm, I'm sure we can share one on Twitter. Maybe we can go seek that one out while we're there. Yeah, that'd be cool. Check out Wyndham's Theater. Back to Jane's note, I have also had a thought about the Hollywood Walk of Fame, as you've mentioned in the podcast. We have a kind of similar but very different thing. There is a church in Covent Garden, St. Paul's, also known as the Actors' Church. They have many plaques lining the walls and pews there. I don't know if you think this may be something worth thinking about. Take care. Jane. Uh, thanks, Jane. That sounds very interesting. We might need to uh, ask David to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> Give David another job. <laughs> Maybe after BreadCon. But that could be really cool. I, I will say I have done a little bit more research into the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Yeah. 
I actually spoke to someone there and learned a few things. Typically, the celebrity has to be nominated by their representative, meaning their agent or manager. In the case of a deceased person, it typically still has to be a representative or maybe a family member, but they only accept one deceased person a year, mm. and it can take up to two years for them to make a decision. And we just missed the cutoff uh, for submissions this year. So I set a reminder to follow up, but I also got a number regarding the fees to make it happen if he is selected. Yeah. Uh, you want to guess at that, Luke? <laughs> I, I looked this up at one point. It's like $20,000. $75,000. 75000 It's like $75,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think the only way that's going to happen is if we stumble across the right supporter who... You know, might be willing to fight for that. You know, Stephen Fry comes to mind, or <laughs> I don't know. I think you know, like Benedict Cumberbatch, or you know, maybe Jude Law. You know, would be the kind of people that we might need to make yeah. that happen. I, it, it's hard to say, but I plan to submit for next year, one way or another. We'll see how far we get, and uh, maybe we'll talk about it again. Yeah. The next note comes from Maria, who writes, "Hi there. I've recently discovered your podcast on YouTube with wonderful timing." as we were just re-watching the Sherlock Holmes episodes on there. Thank you so much for putting it all together. I've just listened to your interview with Prim Hardwick. I've had a soft spot for Edward Hardwick ever since seeing him in Colditz. Anyhow, I was wondering if you had a chance to see his episode of This Is Your Life. It's on YouTube, and they present him with his book on the set of one of the episodes of Sherlock Holmes. I'm not familiar enough to say which one, but there's even a short appearance from Mrs. Hudson, not to mention many other famous personalities he was acquainted with. Thanks again so much for your podcast. You guys are definitely preserving history, Maria. Mm. Thank you so much, Maria. Yeah, I think the episode they interrupt filming on to present him his book is The Three Gables. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. I think so. It has Mary Ellis in it, and she, she was in two of them. I'd have to go back and check. I, I think it was The Three Gables. No, I think it's The Three Gables. I'm pretty sure yeah. it is. It, it is a very touching little show for Edward. He's acknowledged by many of his peers, including a few from the Granada series, Michael Jaston, uh, who was in Lady Frances Carfax, Mary Ellis, who I mentioned. Ronnie Corbett is in there, Robert Stevens, Anthony Hopkins, Peter O'Toole. I mean, uh, yeah. Edward knew everybody. everybody. Edward was loved. Yeah. But very conspicuously missing is Jeremy Brett. Mm. And we reached out to Edward's wife, Prim Hardwick, about this. It's kind of a sad story. Basically, Jeremy was in a bad place at that moment, and he refused to go on the show with Edward. Apparently, he was feeling cross with Ted for even doing it because Jeremy thought it should be him on the program. But clearly, it was his illness talking in that moment, and he just was so unwell around that time. Mm. Prim said, in the end, Jeremy asked his friend Robert to go in his place and to say a few words instead, his friend being Robert Stevens. So, very interesting that. I I've always felt like This Is Your Life is kind of a saccharine show. It's just something about it, it sits mm. oddly with me. I don't know. It just feels exploitative when I sit down to watch one. But that said, I, I'm sad they didn't do one for Jeremy. That would have been something, you know, we could all look forward to. Yeah, it's unfortunate, you know, but actors are people too and feelings get hurt. Who knows? I kind of feel like I know more about Edward now and I actually want to go back and watch some of those earlier performances. Yeah. Maybe they didn't ask Jeremy because he just wasn't old enough. I mean, he was only 61 when he died. You know, and Edward, I don't know, I mean, Edward's a little older. I'm not sure. He's not that much older than Jeremy, but I don't know. Peter Cushing was like 88 when they did his, um, <laughs> but yeah. at least we got one with Edward, you know, and, and some familiar faces too. Yeah. But yeah, it's on YouTube and, and it's worth checking out. Definitely worth checking out. The next telegram comes from Fareshta and her sister Masa, who begin with a short little story, which reads, As one sister persuades the other to stay awake, a man in a beard appears through the London fog. The younger sister is sleepy, the elder excited. The picture captures them both. Who is this astonishingly handsome gentleman who plays so subtle with his face, eyes, lips, and hands? The little sister wonders. The older one is pleased as she succeeds in making her little sister feel what she does. Every week passes with anticipation, pure joy, aftertalks, and imitation attempts. The final problem, though, breaks their hearts. The love of a man who once lived far away is so great. In their hearts for many years, it remains. Years later, the elder sister discovers the two brothers admiring the hero as she and her sister used to do. I think she's talking about us. I think she might be. Immersing in their voices and the art itself, she finds herself. 
No, this is too overwhelming to bear alone. Thus, she pleads her little sister to accompany her once again, and she responds, as they share their love for that great man with plenty of others all around the world. And then she writes, Hello, Gus and Luke. Well, that was our story. But to give you some context, back around 2005, when we first encountered the show, the content that aired on Iran's national TV channels was heavily censored, and TV was almost the only source to watch such shows. When I say censored, I mean anything deemed improper, such as scenes involving less than proper women's clothing, women running, hugging, kissing, playing cards, drinks, drugs, etc., were carefully deleted. On top of that, this censorship was extended to translations, sometimes altering the narrative to conform to prescribed norms. However, this compelling show, actor, and story served as a breath of fresh air during those rather dark and colorless years, just 25 years post the Islamic Revolution. It was a source of enlightenment, teaching us critical thinking, inspiring a quest for answers, fostering a love for good music, and so much more. Rewatching the show recently, we were frustrated about all the things we missed because of censorship, but we also developed a deep appreciation of those who fought hard to pass it through censorship, keeping a window open. The skillfulness of Iranian voice actors from that era was noteworthy. Not only did they have perfect voices, but they also did it very professionally. And Fereshta provides a short Farsi-dubbed clip here from the Naval Treaty, and I'll, I'll play a moment of it just for fun. This is near the end of the episode. Check it out. Well, one cannot score every time. Mrs. Hudson, you have risen to the occasion. Won't you join us, Mr. Phelps? Now. What's in this? Kari ba morgh gorda. <laughs> Back to the telegram. Discovering your podcast and revisiting the show, besides the joy of it all, we found ourselves somewhat gloomy. It is sad to feel so much love and admiration for someone you will never meet. Interestingly, reminiscing over those first years of watching the show, we remembered the same sad feeling we had back then, since you couldn't find more than a small, low-quality picture of Jeremy Brett on the internet. There was nothing with which you could quench your thirst for knowing about the great actor. We thought even that feeling attached to the show was probably the reason we never watched it again until recently. That is why we're even more grateful to you who create quality content, sharing it generously with the public. To finish with a challenging question, do you ever feel that having watched Holmes in your teenage years might have a significant subconscious impact on your character, or do you find yourselves consciously attempting to imitate him? And also, do you happen to know who the man with the ottoman hat is in the picture hanging close to the door of Holmes' Baker Street apartment? Warm regards, Fereshta from the U.S. and Masa from Iran. I sincerely hope I got close to saying those names right, uh, but thank you both so much. And that clip was fascinating, especially because even in that little snippet, they, they sort of managed to cut a moment of Miss Hudson out, I think. <laughs> yeah, I watched that. Yeah, and I think they cut her out because she's pouring the brandy. Oh, is that why? Yeah, yeah, okay. We'll put that up on our Twitter so you guys can check it out. Uh, and really, thank you so much for sending that. It's, it's so fascinating to see that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's always f fun to hear things dubbed in other languages by other actors. We actually have a Farsi translation of one of our films that we enjoy putting on <laughs> to this day. Yeah. But so curious just to know, like she said, what they had to go through just to get it. Yeah. Lots of respect for the people that got it on the air, did the voices, somehow got the rights to do it. I mean, all this stuff. It's like, it's really incredible for what it would have done for people over there. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. I would have a question back for them. As she said about women being censored specifically um, yeah. b based on what their role was in the story, were there any episodes that were either cut out or fully censored or, or ultimately really changed when there was a woman in the lead role just based on the fact that it was a woman I'm, I'm curious about that and how they might have changed it so maybe she can write back to us and let us know yeah yeah and to answer your first question did jeremy or sherlock influence our characters as teenagers luke 
as far as like a subconscious Jeremy effect, I think it's possible I had more empathy towards people who were, who were different than me. And definitely the sense of fashion kind of rubbed off on me. I mean, I, I remember early days really enjoying the Hamburg and uh, wanting to track one down. Right. How about you? I have to admit, yes. I mean, I went through a phase where I attempted to think like Holmes every day, you know, making observations and deductions and trying to hone that style of critical thinking. I even have books still on my shelf to this day that teach Holmesian deductive reasoning. So, uh, you know, I'm sure it influenced me in some ways, though I did grow out of that phase mainly because I, I just started to realize that life is so much more complicated now, you know, that many of Holmes's methods were just too specialized to work in modern society. You know what I mean? They, they, a lot more than 140 varieties of cigarette ash nowadays. Yeah. You can't tell much about the fingers of a typist when everybody is one. You know, it's stuff like that. But uh, I, I certainly would like to think that Holmes influenced me in a, in a positive way. As for the second question, the picture of the man with the Ottoman hat hanging in 221B, if it's the picture I'm thinking of, the one that is seen like really well behind John Hector McFarlane and the Norwood Builder, then yes, that yeah. that is Major General Charles George Gordon, nicknamed... Chinese Gordon, and I'll read a tiny bit about him from his Wikipedia page. He was a British army officer. He made his military reputation in China, where he was placed in command of the Ever Victorious Army, which was a force of Chinese soldiers led by European officers, which was instrumental in putting down the Taiping Rebellion because they regularly defeated much larger forces. He later served in Egypt in 1873 and became the governor general of the Sudan, where he did much to suppress revolts of the local slave trade, hmm. Hmm. but he then resigned and returned to Europe in 1880. But when a serious revolt broke out in the Sudan, led by a Muslim religious leader and self-proclaimed Mahdi, uh, Muhammad Ahmad, in early 1884, Gordon was sent back to Khartoum with instructions to evacuate the British, which he did do, but then he defied orders and stayed behind with a loyal group of soldiers. And in the months before the fall of Khartoum, Gordon and the Mahdi corresponded, and Gordon offered him the Sultanate of Kordofan, but the Mahdi instead requested Gordon convert to Islam and join him, which Gordon declined, and everything fell apart. And uh, long story short is just that uh, there was a big war, and Gordon organized a defense which lasted a year, and he got very famous in British papers for doing that, but because he was there without permission, the government didn't like him very much. And it took him a year to send a relief force, and it arrived two days late. Gordon had been killed, mm. and uh, the city had fallen. So there you go. And actually, we do have a copy of that very picture somewhere, which, uh, who knows, maybe we'll see that in Relics Volume 3, Luke, maybe? It's possible. It's one of those things. It's, it's always there. It's always visible. So maybe we should have one. Yeah, and I'll tell you another funny thing is I noticed the exact same picture on the wall in the Ian Richardson Hound of the Baskervilles. So did I, yeah. The next note comes from Thomas in Canada and is entitled, What Happened to the Pipe? He writes, Hi Gus and Luke. Hope you are well and thanks again for all the shows. I cried at the end of the June Wyndham Davies episode when she talked about the day he flew away. So crushing. I meant to send you this information below some time ago. I hope it helps in sorting out where Jeremy's pipe got to. And yeah, he's talking about the original church warden that Jeremy had in season one, which mm -hmm. was replaced in the subsequent seasons. It reads as follows. In 1989, Jeremy received the award of Pipe Smoker of the Year, and during an interview for the morning show TVAM on ITV, Jeremy smiled as he told the presenter, Mike Morris, of how he had lost one of his valuable pipes during the filming of The Greek Interpreter. Anyway, it was an, I think I'm getting someone, something like that, which has an yeah. amber stem. This is the one that he smoked. At, this is all in the books, in the Copper yeah. Beaches. That's, that's a lovely pipe, and you can mm. gesture with it. Now, he used that when, when, he, when his, he was in his, relaxing. In or? his disputatious moods. Yes. Mm -hmm. when he's and this was in his meditative moods, just like Popeye. Yes. That's <laughs> great, isn't and it? And that whole day, it gets very hard. It hurt about the days. Now, you've got, and I know that if you get the details wrong, these, you get slaughtered, I don't brought you? these because I haven't got the one I'm being given because I'm not allowed to see that till lunchtime. No. I'm told that's very special because I was robbed when I was doing, um, I think, the Greek interpreter. We had some VIPs around and they stole my pipe. Yeah. I think it was either the Young Conservatives or the Royal Valley. I bet it was the Young Conservatives. <laughs> Congratulations on all your successes and wish you the best for 2024, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Thomas. And Thomas's website is thomaschristopherhicks.ca, 
where you can find his latest children's book, The Stream. Mm. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think we talked about that, and I was never able to trace down that quote from Jeremy, so that's great to have it on record here. Uh, and yeah, if the person who has that pipe is listening, shame on you, and also, please do leave it to us in your will. <laughs> we'll make sure it has a place of honor in our museum. Or send it to us now. We'll bring it to BrettCon. No questions asked. Everyone's happy. Absolutely. The next telegram comes from a new friend of the show, Holly. She writes, My dear Gus and Luke, my name is Holly and I am from North London. From what I have heard from the podcast so far, I am only on the Musgrave Ritual. I am one of your younger listeners, if not the youngest, as I am 18 years old. I turn 19 in four days and if you could wish me a happy birthday, that would be the best present ever. I am getting the whole DVD box set of the Granada series as well, which I am very excited about. Well, happy birthday, Holly. Happy birthday, Holly. Yeah, congratulations on the box set. If you're like us, that will make for many hundreds of hours of rewatchable goodness. And there are bonus features hidden in there. Yeah. Uh, They're not easy to find. They're not listed. But um, just always keep an eye out for buttons to press and weird things to find. It's a a good little treasure hunt. Yeah, well, it depends on the set, too. So, I mean, if she's getting in the UK, I'm not totally sure how hers will go down. but, uh, But yeah, either way, it's a great thing to have. Back to Holly, I adore your podcast and listen to it all the time, especially when I'm traveling around London. I know I'm a new fan, but I love this podcast because it points out things about the show I would never otherwise notice and makes me love it and Mr. Jeremy Brett even more. I discovered the Granada series last summer after watching Star Trek The Next Generation, as I felt a void when I finished watching it, and my favorite character is Data, who loves Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Side question, have you watched Elementary Dear Data, and if so, what do you think of it? So I started watching it, and I fell in love. I stopped watching after David Burke left because I was literally heartbroken over his departure, and I still think he is the supreme Watson. It took me several months to get over this tragedy, but around the start of the year, I dried my eyes and sucked up my devastation and started watching the rest of the episodes. This turned my passionate interest into an obsession. Some of my favorite episodes are The Blue Carbuncle, The Illustrious Client, The Six Napoleons, and The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax, but your podcast reminds me how much I love them all. As I said, I have many more episodes of the pod to catch up on, but would love to ask you some questions that I hope haven't been asked yet. My first and main question to the two of you is, if Sherlock Holmes were a real person and you got to meet him, what kind of questions would you ask him? My next question is, are you part of any Sherlock Holmes societies or clubs? I would like to join one, but I don't know much about them, and I'm probably not the usual demographic as I'm a young female goth. My final question is, have you listened to the Sherlock & Co. podcast? I love it and would definitely recommend it if you haven't. Thank you both for all the hard work and effort you put into the podcast and spreading love for Jeremy Brett, who is the best actor ever. Very sincerely yours, Holly. Well, thank you so much, Holly. Welcome to the club. Yeah. As to your questions, if we could meet Sherlock Holmes, I honestly, I don't know what I would say to him. I'd probably just ask him if I could follow him around on a case (laughs) just to see him in action. Do you need a photographer? (laughs) I'm here. Let's do it. I'd like to, uh, you know, pose him some philosophical questions, maybe the kind of ones that are actually in that Star Trek episode about, you know, life and meaning and all that. But since his mind was solely focused on crime and in the stories at one point, he even mentions that he doesn't even care that the earth revolves around the sun. I'm not sure he'd have insights into any of that deeper stuff. You know, the questions of our age. I don't know. I might still try. Well, curiously, I'm watching The Next Generation right now. Have you watched that episode yet? I haven't watched that episode yet. I mean, I have seen The Next Generation, but I'm starting it from the beginning. Yeah. And But I just watched, I think it was episode five of the first season, where no one has gone before, and it's where Data actually first gets introduced to Sherlock. Yeah. And so even that one was curious. I mean, just curious timing that I watched it literally today. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, Data's a great character, and I think uh, he would definitely love Holmes. Yeah, well... My three favorite shows are The Twilight Zone, Star Trek The Next Generation, and The Granada Sherlock Holmes Show, in no particular order. Yeah. So I definitely love Elementary Dear Data, and I, I think it's come up on the show before, but you know Daniel Davis, he was a very good Moriarty. Uh, he even makes a cameo, actually, in season three of Picard, uh, not really in a meaningful way, but, but he is there. But, but like many, I would only say that season two of Next Gen, probably not my favorite season overall. Dr. Pulaski and all, but I watched the part where Picard confronts Moriarty on the holodeck in in preparation for this conversation, and it just made me long for intelligent television, (laughs) you know, even more than I usually do, just to see 
such great actors actually talking about meaningful things. <sighs> you know, I, I I just miss the old days. I guess I don't know. I, I'm just being an old man, but uh, but similar on the on that front. You mentioned Twilight Zone, so if you're feeling a void after Sherlock, you should definitely check out Twilight Zone because that's a deep well to go into. Mm-hmm. But also Futurama, because <laughs> they just reference Star Trek all the time. Mm-hmm. And there's even an episode that takes place in the holodeck and Moriarty's there and it's a whole thing. And so yeah. there's lots of places to go. But as for the Sherlock Society, we're not a part of any of them, uh, at least not yet. But I think you should definitely join and shake the thing up. Yeah, there's one in London that's, I think it's one of the oldest and best ones. It's the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know a ton about it, but I, I think it's only like 20 pounds to join. And I don't know what that gets you, you know, beyond a newsletter, but I... I do believe they have meetups and so on. So if you, if you do join, mm-hmm. please let us know how it is. Like Luke says, you know, we're just kind of ignorant of these societies and clubs. But, uh, you know, maybe someday we'll make a study of all the organizations that are out there. I would say, you know, in the meantime, you might dig into the archives of the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere podcast as they deep dive into these kind of things all the time. Definitely. As for the Sherlock & Co. podcast, I have not heard of it, but uh, I will check it out for sure. I've heard of it, and I've been meaning to listen to it, and I just haven't yet, but it's on the list. Yeah. The next note comes from Morgan. Dear Gus and Luke, my name is Morgan. I'm a 44-year-old teacher and Holmesian living in Uppsala, Sweden. I've been a fan of the series since I was a teenager in the early 1990s when the Casebook episodes were first broadcast there. The first episode I saw was The Illustrious Client, a powerful story, and to this day, one of my favorite films. Then I discovered that there had been earlier episodes too, and I started collecting them on VHS. As I found like-minded friends in the Baskerville Club of Sweden, more people helped me fill in the gaps in my collection until it was complete. Eventually, the VHS collection was replaced by DVDs, and more recently with the German Blu-ray set. It may interest you to know that I found the complete Blu-ray set has restored half a line of dialogue to the blue carbuncle, which had been missing from the standard Region 2 DVDs. The first act ends on Holmes's line, the blue carbuncle, indeed, which would have preceded the advertisement break. Act two begins with the words, it's perfectly unique, which mysteriously were missing from the DVD set. Perhaps they were deleted to allow the music to play over a fade to black and into the beginning of act two. Happily, this line has been restored. Secondly, and more interestingly, the Blu-ray set includes a sound effect, which to my knowledge has been missing from commercial releases in the UK. In The Hound of the Baskervilles, as Sir Charles Baskerville is running frantically back to the hall, some versions include the baying of a hound in the distance. For example, the old off-air recording I used to have on VHS had this, but the commercially released VHS copy from the early 90s, as well as later DVDs, cut this sound effect, an anomaly which makes little sense in the context. Why would Sir Charles be running so frantically if all he could hear was the wheezing sound of a hound? In a study in celluloid, Michael Cox is critical of the moment and notes that the scene ought to have included the hound baying. Clearly, he was watching a copy in which the hound did nothing right in the nighttime. This has made me wonder which additions include the terrifying sound of the hellish hound and which don't, and why it's missing from some of them. I may add that I have played both the German and the English soundtrack of the Blu-ray edition, and the effect is there on both, but the German one sounds different and more muted, as though a different voice actor was playing the part. Keep up the good work. Morgan, chairman of Dr. Mortimer's Correspondence. Curious. Yeah, great observations, Morgan. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that really is interesting uh, to think about Michael Cox watching the DVDs and not hearing the hound sound. I was actually thinking about that when I was researching it, and I have to admit I, w- I was a little confused by his words, but this makes his comments make a lot more sense. I actually went and checked all the copies I have, and I can report that The Howl is on the Spanish Blu-rays, it's on the American Blu-rays and BritBox in the U.S., but I also checked the YouTube version, and it does not have The Howl, Hmm. as Sir Charles runs in the intro. I doubt it, but I wondered if it was possible if it was just a rights issue. Maybe they did use some stock audio, and then maybe they realized they didn't have the rights to it, so they took it out, but that seems very unlikely. Yeah, it's strange, though, because, you know, as these things get passed along to different distributors to be released, we have noticed things change, you know, whether it's the the credits, that footage isn't upscaled, you know what I mean? Like, or 
the occasional matte painting that might be different or something like that right. in the background. Like it's it's sometimes there's a mix thing, you know, with the bounce down that happens, especially if things are in five point one space. Yeah. Well, the vocals are supposed to be in the center speaker. And when they get bounced down to stereo, they have to get spread a certain way. And so maybe if the hound at that moment was panned on a bizarre channel, yeah, yeah, maybe then it just got bounced out and it got turned way down or something. Possibly. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Dale writes in with some observations from our earlier adventures. He writes, Hi, guys. I'm really enjoying your podcast immensely. And I had an observation about the dancing men. Even though it's always been one of my favorite stories, there is one major plot hole that I've always found difficult to grasp. Holmes writes to Abe Slaney in The Dancing Men Code from Riddlingthorpe Manor, imploring him to, quote, come here at once, which Abe Slaney obviously assumes is being sent to him from Elsie Cubitt. My question is, why would he just waltz back up to the manor house and casually knock on the door and ask if Elsie Cubitt is at home? He had just been there the night before and shot Hilton Cubitt in the chest and then fled through the window. He must have known that he had killed poor Mr. Cubitt. He knew Elsie loved her husband, and yet he returns the next day at her summons? He was a gangster from America. He would have no suspicion that the police might have been there in the wake of his having killed Elsie's husband? What did he think was going to happen? That Elsie was summoning him there to allow him to take her back to America and that they were going to live happily ever after? He had just killed her husband. It just never seemed very plausible that he would come back to Riddlingthorpe Manor after having committed murder, even if he did believe Elsie had summoned him using the Dancing Men code. He has a few more uh, observations, but we can jump in here. Yeah, I mean, it's a little far-fetched when you think about it too long, but... But he's crazed. Yeah, well, right, and I, I just assumed that his passion for Elsie, you know, and that he was just so happy that she would actually write him back that he just assumed in his ego that she had come around to him, you know, exactly. and, and, and charged head, headlong into his own demise. I mean, he stomped over from America and was like, you're coming with me. Yeah. And then she says, come here at once. And he's like, finally, you see in the light. Yeah. I think it's ego. He's just blinded. It, it's far-fetched, but I think it's believable enough given given the character. He, he was unhinged. Yeah. Back to Dale regarding the resident patient. When Holmes and Watson arrive at Brook Street and learn that Mr. Blessington has been hanged, Upon entering the house, the maid, Nora, is standing at the foot of the stairs, hysterically crying her eyes out. Standing next to her is a constable, busily taking notes. It seems clear that he's supposed to be taking a statement from Nora, but what exactly could he be writing? All she is doing is crying. <laughs> so I always assume that it would be funny if we could see what he's writing on the notepad, and it simply reads, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, boo-hoo-hoo. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that too. Good eye. You know, that just feels like a theatrical staging, that little moment to me. We could speculate and maybe guess that she was talking before. She had just divulged something. Yeah. And then he's like catching up while she's crying. Right, right. Or to his point, maybe it's a little bit of uh, Simon Pegg from Hot Fuzz and you just write down everything because you never know what's going to come up. So it is boo hoo, boo hoo. Dale goes on to say. When Holmes and Watson returned to Brook Street later that day, after having found the newspaper clipping about the Great Worthington Bank affair, the maid is busy serving out tea and cake to the inspector and Dr. Trevelyan, and then to Holmes and Watson as they arrive. How weird is that, though? They're sitting there in the room where Blessington was murdered and found that very day, drinking tea and eating cake atop the strong box that had been used to help kill him, and yet no one seems bothered by this whatsoever. That's the English for you, I guess. Well, yeah, I guess you you just move on quick. Right. I mean, Holmes walks in and grabs the whole body and lowers him. So, I mean, maybe drinking tea isn't such a big deal after that. And honestly, that's kind of why I like it is just that, frankly, it's so of the time and of the upper class that they literally would just bust out the tea and cakes. And Tea and cakes is a weird thing anyway. I mean, David tells us, you know, that they take a cake break while they're playing cricket. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, you, can't, you can't take these things serious. <laughs> Finally, Dale says... Regarding the final problem, here's a minor detail I wanted to point out. In the sequence where Moriarty is attempting to sell the fake Mona Lisa to the American millionaire, he later says, I'm sorry, Mr. Morgan, but this painting is no longer for sale. I've always taken that to be an insinuation that the millionaire was none other than the American financier J.P. Morgan. Granted, the actor looks nothing like the real J.P. Morgan, but I would wager that at the turn of the century that there would be no other American who could possibly have offered a cool four million for a painting. Just a thought. Also, the insult that Mr. Morgan hurls at Moriarty's assistant as he's forcibly ushered away is, take your hands off me, you mick, 
which of course is a well-known insult towards the Irish. Mm. Great show, you guys. I'm really enjoying them and loving the various things you point out that I failed to notice. Sincerely, Dale. Well, many thanks, Dale. And yes, I actually had thought about that a long time ago, that the, J- the J.P. Morgan thing. Yeah. John Hawksworth wrote that one, and he's no longer with us, so I'm not sure we'll ever know for sure. But it's, it's one moment from the show that always makes me laugh. Yeah, maybe that was why. Maybe it was such, such a specific reference. Yeah. I also like the way he says million, which is with Y's instead of L. Four million. I think that was like the guy's last role that he ever played. I, I can't remember. Yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah. We'll have to check back. We'll listen to our own podcast and find out. Okay, our last bit of mail for the day comes from Jeff, who writes, Hey guys, I stumbled on your YouTube videos in 2021. I was only peripherally aware of the Granada series from PBS listings years ago, but had never seen them. The initial plan was just to get caught up with the episodes you had already recapped, but intrigued by the questionable reputation of the later entries, I went ahead and binged the rest of the series. I enjoyed most of the episodes and Jeremy Brett's performance without ever becoming emotionally involved like you two. I totally get it, though. At 65, I still have a fair share of fanboy obsessions of my own. I've been a Holmes fan from youth. In fact, my parody, The Case of Nothing in Particular, found its way into Robert Hess's giant Sherlockian collection of memorabilia that was recently on auction. But coming to The Hound of the Baskervilles, I decided to watch every version of the story I could get my hands on after seeing the Brett episode. I'm sure many others have done this, but I was amazed by the sheer number of selections available. I even sat through the Russian and Danish versions. I must say that the 1939 Basil Rathbone adaptation still holds up well, despite production code limitations. The best visually was the 1983 version, but it suffered from a weak and overly jovial Holmes in the miscast Ian Richardson. Although obviously compromised, I think that the Granada episode still ranks fairly high on the list. As a footnote to all these viewings, I am now resting comfortably in a hospital still haunted by visions of missing boots and origins of walking sticks. Keep up the great work, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And... Always remember, a little brandy goes a long way in alleviating visions. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, there really are so many adaptations one could check out. Maybe down the line, I'll seek out a few more. But I, I, I just think, in a strange way, my most treasured takeaway from doing all of this research on the Granada version is just that it's really pretty good by comparison to so many of them. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think all the adaptations suffer in some way or another. But at least Jeremy did get to take a swing at it. Yeah, it would have been a shame if we didn't get anything. Right. And then we would just be imagining this spectral hound forever. Maybe one day we'll be able to take a crack at our own version. I think the time is right for it. I, I do. I, I, I think it's a topic for another day. Mm. But uh, I think we're ready for a new hound. The hound is a tricky story to get right. Mm-hmm. And I think the same could possibly be said about a podcast covering it. But by thunder, we tried. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully our episode isn't fraught with the same curse as the Hound, but I mean, you put a lot of work into this one, so I hope you're satisfied by the end of this, Gus. Oh, it was hard. I'm not going to lie. This was the hardest podcast I've ever worked on. And frankly, even our conversation, I felt it as we were going through, like it felt disjointed to me, but that's because the episode is disjointed. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's hard to kind of stay on track when things are disjointed, but uh, ah, you know, we're we're all fans and I think everybody out there is going to is going to understand where we're coming from on this one. So hopefully everybody enjoys it. Yeah, this felt like a big one. This felt like a milestone. And like I said, I hope nobody uh, burns their copy of the podcast if that's even a possible thing to do. And I just want to say thanks to everyone out there for sticking with us. Yes. There are so many great episodes yet to cover, and we're looking forward to each of them. Yeah. Thanks, Luke. And thanks again to our producer, David Yule, for assembling the incredible group of cast and crew interviews showcased in this episode. And a sincere special thanks to Fiona Gillies, Christopher Tabori, James Faulkner, Alistair Duncan, William Ilkley, Trevor Bowen, Kate Turner, and June Wyndham Davies for sharing their memories with us. And you can hear even more from those interviews in our special extended interview episode, where you'll get even more fantastic behind the scenes stories from the making of The Hound of the Baskervilles from the actors and crew who brought it to the screen. That podcast should be dropping shortly. And for those who are interested in joining us in London for BrettCon 2024, tickets are still available via our website, sherlockpodcast.com. And if you have any questions about the event, 
or would just like to share your thoughts on the show, you can reach us at contact at sherlockpodcast.com. And of course, none of this would be possible without our wonderful friends and supporters on Patreon. To those of you who have stuck with us through all the recent craziness, we just can't thank you enough. And if you would like to join us there for additional content, bonus features, discounts, and more, you can find us at patreon.com slash sherlockpodcast. Well, Hound was a monster, no pun intended. Our next episode will be a beast of a different sort as we dive deep into the legendary stage play starring Jeremy Brett and Edward Hardwick in their respective roles. I refer to The Secret of Sherlock Holmes. Until then... (laughs) 